that. Dang, you were almost in October, baby. Then. Yeah, October sounds like a pretty cool month. I found out yeah. I was uh, born on the exact same day Michael Jackson was. Oh. <laughs> you know what you call a 12-year-old uh, uh, pair of buns with a 50-year-old slab of meat? A Mick Jackson. <laughs> yeah, well, my birthday's coming up. What day is it on? Halloween? No, it's October 9th. It's a Friday. Oh, so you're a Libra too then? Yeah, it's coming up. I work that day, so it kind of sucks. Yeah, get used to it. You'll work all the rest of your birthdays too. <laughs> I don't, I really don't care. I'm like, eh. All right. How long have you been working um, uh, EMS? Like, okay. So I was, I don't know if this really counts, but I was a reserve firefighter for San Diego County for like, like nine months. And then I, I got hired with AMR and I've been with AMR for about a year, five months now. But I also, I was also working with Cal Fire Riverside. So, I don't know, roughly like maybe two years or so. Uh, do you notice um, how close attention do you pay to holidays? Like how like close attention do I pay? Like, you know all the holidays and they're coming up. Yeah. It's Valentine's, Easter, all that shit. You pay attention to that stuff? Not really. Not not anymore. Why? Because uh, I always I always work. Exactly. <laughs> You could tell you worked this job long time, especially if you're full time, because if it wasn't for stuff going up at the store, like decorations for the holidays, I would like half the time not even know, because you're always working and uh, yeah. you don't really care, except the fact that you might get double time or if you're with the fire department, PTO or something like that. So oh, yeah. Holidays, double time, bring it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm lucky this year because I work every Friday, and I looked it up, and every Friday is a holiday. It's Christmas, yeah. New Year's. Perfect. I'm like, yeah, baby. Friday's a deal. Friday's yeah. a deal. I was working Thursday and Fridays, but I, I had to tell – I just told my soup, and I was like, I can't do it both, so I can only do one. It's either that or I'll go. And I guess they're super desperate for medics. Even though I'm not a medic, they were like, yeah, so once you read class, you know, just work with us. Yeah, it works. I mean, uh, <clears throat> take it take it while you can because when they're full, um, <laughs> they're, they're not so easy to negotiate with. So if you're yeah, a good I was Yeah, I was super surprised because a lot of – well, Abel Martinez, do you remember him? Abel, Abel. yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, he he told them that he was going through paramedic school, and they didn't even give him part time. What company did he work for? EMR. It must be, uh, yeah, I don't know the, which who the operations manager is or whatever. So yeah, so it it was really rough on him for like you know the first two weeks, and then he ended up quitting AMR, and then he quit here, and I was like, oh man, like he's got. Uh, did he tell you why? No, he's, he mentioned something about L.A. County, but I, I'm not too sure. Oh, that's Abel. Yeah, he's kind of uh, – I'm thinking about the other kid, uh, Nate, Nate, Nate or whatever. One of the guys who dropped out, he dropped out because he's sick. Oh, yeah, Nanny. Yeah, yeah. Nanny got sick. I, I, I had sent him some information to uh, see if it could work on getting better. And then Abel, yeah, I'm not sure what he's doing. He was L.A. County, no L.A. County, L.A. County, no L.A. County. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't really heard from him. He was like my friend. I just told I him know. if he had a chance of getting picked up by L.A. County, better start PT and now because they PT like seven days a week. Stress fractures and injuries are knocking out a lot of them. One of the guys from our department, he's built like – he's basically like a, a Terminator. I mean, he's just freaking muscles, everything. We grapple together. Um, and they started PT like every day. And then of course they're doing turnout shit and drills and, 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 uh, it, it cracked his tibia, got a stress yeah. fracture his tibia. And, uh, because you can't like get used to that fast, you have to gradually build up to running. Otherwise you'll break shit. 
And uh, yeah, that, like, uh, able. Yeah, that's why I got been. I started working out just on my. I mean, I'm not a big guy. I'm more of a little guy. I consider myself a little guy. But to be a firefighter, you're gonna need to be all muscular. You don't need but, to be muscular. You need to be strong. There's plenty of muscular. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been working a lot of like my like cardio based thing. I work out with Chris Bowie, so he's been helping me a lot. He's a he's a really good partner. He motivates me. Really Doesn't hard work. <laughs> yeah. So how much actual jogging or running are you doing? Uh, I try to do cardio like twice a week. Let's back off a of cardio. How much impact work do you do, jogging or running, and not on a treadmill? No, I, I, I run at RCC. Uh, I run the flights of stairs. So Try um, doing, a, if not flights of stairs, stairs are kick-ass. I love them. But when you're running flat distance, uh, stress fractures is a real issue. The military hits it all the time, uh, even in special forces. It's like you, it takes months for the bone to create the density that's very unique to the loading you get when you're jogging, especially jogging. Yeah, I, I runs, you're, you're, you're waddling. You're kind of going up and down, whereas if you run faster, you actually have a little bit less stress depending on your running technique. And stairs doesn't recreate that. Stairs yeah. is a good workout, but it doesn't prepare your bones. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of got away from, like, running because when I was going through a fire academy, I started noticing that I was, like, my knees were trying to, were no like, shit. I don't know, they were hurting. Well, do you think so they will like, hurt again when you're running five days a week? <laughs> So uh, I was like, I should probably give it a break. But I, I consider myself a good runner. I think I could, I could run for days. Okay, just uh, be forewarned. All I could say is uh, learn from uh, where people are falling out and why. At least do some rope skipping. Um, something where you're doing a little bit of jarring because your bones grow with shock. Oh, Thanks really? to what's known as a piezoelectric effect. Just loading a bone, it takes a lot of weight. But if you jump and now you're jarring the bones, it's that compressive load that stimulates density and nothing but running, bouncing. Uh, that's where plyos can come into play. A couple times a week, that could do wonders for creating a, 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 a reinforced bone thickness. <laughs> yeah. And Michael Moore, or Hector Suarez. That's why I don't run. Uh, the interesting thing is a uh, knee pain is not the running is bad. It shows that you have an imbalance in your system, usually in your hips and your core, uh, because your ass is your steering muscle for your legs. You ever see people running? Watch them. Sometimes they run in one foot, like skates out to one side. Okay, almost everyone has like an irregular footstep. Other people, they waddle from side to side. Um, and then you have people where you watch them, especially with females, it's easier to see, but one leg buckles when they run. They're just all cattywampus. There's all sorts of technical errors that will cause your knees to hurt. It's not the running itself that's bad. When they actually measure the cartilage and trained runners, their cartilage gets thicker and better with yeah. running. But if you have imbalances, it's like having a tire on your car where the alignment isn't right. What do you do to your tire? You wear the thread down? You wear it out. Completely, you wear it out unevenly, in fact. So your hips and your core and your feet are all part of your alignment system. And if any one of those is missing, that your warning sign is pain in your knees or in the hips or ankles. So that, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, uh, I was running I was running one time. Uh, I don't know if you know a guy. He's a captain for Riverside City, Captain Bell. And then uh, we were running, and I was running next to him. And I thought I was a good runner. And then he was like, you're making too much noise when you run. So you, you should probably glide. You need to glide. And I was like, what the heck? How do you glide? And like, that guy is an animal. I don't know how he does it, but he doesn't make any noise when he runs. Why do you think that is? Uh, okay, I guess you're I running could. along like someone wearing flippers. Mm -hmm. Flop, flop, flop out there. <laughs> making that noise. I mean, I don't think I was making noise, but he's just a super good runner. He's a – I was like, oh, my God. I thought – after that, I started, like, to adjust my running. But Bell and yeah, remember, if you, just, if you just change your butt muscles and just your glute max, 
Uh, that's great, but those are actually uh, lumbopelvic. Basically, almost everyone they find with a knee problem, they'll find a one of the three gluteal muscles out of whack, and sometimes it's a coordination thing. But yeah, well, you think running is so natural because it is. You know, you run when you're a kid, you don't think about it. And I used to run distance and compete. And when Dang. someone says, "Oh, you need to learn how to run," my first thing is like, "Whatever, I run a five-minute mile. You know, you got nothing to show me," type thing. Yeah. yeah Every time I say that, I wind up eating shit for years afterwards. Uh, there's so much about running that people don't know, and one of the worst things you could do to your running. Any any guesses? What is the one thing that has started ruining running running the past century? Uh, I don't know. I don't I'm going to give you a hint. It has to do with name brands. Shoes? Shoes. Thank you. Shoes. You want to fix shoes. your running? Run barefoot. Yeah. People not run long, wrong for very long. I took the nurse out at NorthNet, and she wanted to know how to improve her running because she's having knee pains and stuff. I said, let's go outside. And uh, she was like, well, how do I run? I said, just run. Take off your shoes. And we'll go along. You always got to start slowly, mind you. And what the hell is up with TJ? And I and she goes, what do I do? I said, trust me, run. And after about one minute, she's like, oh, I get it. Because your feet will let you know if you're running wrong. And with puffy shoes, you don't know. Hey there, yeah, what's that's... up? Are you? Oh. Say I run with bands now. Where are you guys? I'm looking for indoors. Um... Uh... Are you talking, you're stuck in the waiting room or something like that? Oh no, come to this one here. This is the one for this afternoon. Okay, so I got, I'm gonna, uh, because I put it on the, uh, the um, on Zoom and it normally sends it out to you. Did you get it or not? He's quick, okay. bro. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put an announcement. I'm gonna put the address there so it'll show, it should show up on your phone and hopefully get out to everyone. We're just talking about Robert and him running like a fish out of water. <laughs> Barefoot running sounds like a fad, but when I look at, if you ever watch like the World War II movies or movies about the guys, even in Vietnam before, they're running in regular boots. And Olympic runners until the 60s ran in flats, like sprinters do now. And the yeah. fastest runners in the world run barefoot. So uh, when we've added shoes, the rate of injuries skyrocketed. It was a big project uh, of mine to look this shit up. So it was kind of interesting. So let me, hold on. I got to go back and invite um, everyone here. Yeah, go ahead. Apparently uh, some people went to the previous group. Uh, yeah, that, that's why I run with Vans. Cause they're flat and people make fun of me for it. But I'm like, when I go to like test for like, take my seat pad of Biddle, I take my Vance and they're like, what the hell? But I run better like that. Um, try, I mean, you do that. You definitely do. Um, I would recommend, <sighs> come on. I would recommend going barefoot because when you so much as add a layer of socks to your feet, you change the feedback mechanism. Yeah. So I'll give you a perfect analogy. Have you ever uh, typed? Do you type on a computer uh, pretty decently? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm not very good at typing. Okay. So let me ask you this. How many people here think they would type better if they put on a pair of gloves? I don't think it really matters. Really. If you don't think it matters, put them on, try. Okay, how about typing with a pair of mittens on? Dang. Pretty impossible, right? So uh, <laughs> when you wear shoes, your hands and feet have the exact same number of nerves as everyone else, as, as, your, as, as each other. And when you start wearing gloves, imagine if you grew up wearing gloves on your hands. What do you think would be, how sensitive do you think your hands would be? Extremely sensitive. They get less sensitive because you're wearing the gloves. Oh, never mind. Well, if you take them off, though. <laughs> but now they're hypersensitive. Uh -huh. So what do you do when you go barefoot? Your feet are super, super sensitive because they're, like, way oversensitized. But if you wear gloves on, they aren't sensitive enough. 
So the kind of interesting thing is when I, um, as soon as you start barefoot running or walking, they notice the shock load on your knees and hips and, and spine decrease all the way up to your neck. Let's see if anyone else got this here. But warning to the wise, and you guys are younger, so it's easier. If you do start to jog barefoot, um, I've started it again. You got to be super gradual because uh, it will wear your calves out hard because you're going to be centrically loading. You're not going to be able to land flat footed when you're barefoot. Like a terrible time for your skin. Yeah, you're, you, it takes time. You should you know, like, literally start with uh, running like 100 feet. But within like a month, Pecorito. Yeah. Credo, mute whatever that noise is. What's that? that? Mute yourself. What is making all the noise there? I think that's just his microphone. Yeah, it's handled. Man, Gotti, you're so mean, bro. Gosh, Gotti. Gotti. All right, so squad leaders, get me a count. Let me know who's missing. Hmm. Squad one's all here. Thank you. Squad four is all here. Squad three, two. Squad two's here. Let me see here. Is TJ here? Or not? Yes, sir. Where are you? Squad three's here, sir. And class president, where is he? I'm looking. I can't I'll see. Keep talking. There you go. I got you. Okay. I just got your text message, so I'm not sure which came first. <clears throat> no, you guys sent that a while ago. All right. Good deal. So um, then I'm going to mute the phone right now. <clears throat> so we got kind of got the, this morning that talk about the uh, assessment. Um, kind of the assessment method. So I'll try that next week as add cases, because uh, each case has to be gotten to get them for real case studies, either personal from other medics or from uh, the hospitals, physicians. And then we just kind of like, if it's a hospital call where obviously the physicians are talking about way more crap. Um, yeah, Barbara is admitted now, thank you. <clears throat> um, then we could do stuff like throw parallel cases, like two different presentations of a pneumo, you know, but we have to build up the, 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 the database. So as far as um, the quiz, I gave the, uh, if anyone came with like even the most feeble excuse, um, then I gave you a, a rego on it. Um, most people actually like we did the test. Uh, I think it was Robert Aguilera brought up the issue of it was too long or too fast of a quiz. So I don't want you to get jammed up because you're like slower at reading because that kind of defeats the purpose of it. Obviously, there's a kind of minimum level of speed you have to be able to read at, okay, uh, to do this job, period. Um, so, but some people are finishing in like 15 minutes and getting 50 points. Um, I had my wife do it, and I thought she was going to take 30 minutes, and she got 39 points in, 15, in 14 or 16 minutes, whatever it was. And she doesn't even know the shit. She just guessed her way through half of it. She always knew the calories 
and she can uh she knew the definitions but some of the stuff that you guys would know like hhs versus dka she didn't know the point was is could you read through it and then i had someone else test it to make sure so going before i go further um if you haven't taken the quiz then you get the zero um on some of the grades thanks to was it miranda or, or rommel uh, one of the scores wasn't entered and when i entered his score it actually lowered his grade right here, that, sir. okay that stumped us for a second because it was like wait a second how can you add you know x number of points and lower your grade well this is because the your grade point average is based on submitted assignments i'll fix that okay i did that because i didn't want them to count uncommitted i didn't want basically un undone assignments to count against your grade point average what I noticed as I went back through is there are quite a few people that didn't do, for example, uh, video assignments or what have you. The system registered it as not done, but it didn't count those points. So when I'm done this week of putting zeros in for those missed assignments, there's gonna be a few people whose GPA is going to drop considerably. So heads up on that. Uh, that that's what you, what you're going to see if you see a change it's going to be because you did not turn in something and you'll get a zero for it and that's going to affect your grade point average <clears throat> no one wants to see you fail but if you're not even doing the work then 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 you basically i know i'm not talking not that video i'm talking <laughs> get the little message from dixon um i'm not talking about the videos that you submit and i'm talking about for example the earlier videos where you had to answer questions about them and so forth and submit those that give you your score back immediately. Those ones, there were a number of those that were not done. As far as the submitted videos for the Bell's palsy, stroke assessment, um, the GI bleed, those I'll enter manually. And those, 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 those are as they're done. So that's on the quiz. Can you remind me what videos you're talking about before that? Uh, remember the videos on, for example, the uh, the thoracic pump, uh, beta blockers, especially the first two, three weeks where it was like, look at the video and answer these questions. Oh, okay, okay, I got it, sir. Remember the nightmare, the, the I'll never do it again nightmare of fill in the blank ones? Those ones there, okay? So those ones are, are the ones that haven't been done by everyone. I was actually kind of surprised. There's several uh, hoodlums here that didn't do them at all. So that, then that's, you know, that's pretty much on you. And uh, this last quiz, uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole quiz now unless there's a particular uh, uh, question or problem that someone had where looking back on it, they didn't see what they messed up. I'll look through mine real quick. Well, not now because i'm not going to get back to it but if, when you took the quiz if you missed the problem it gave you the right answer some of it would have been attention to detail i got my wife on that she put the uh, milliliters instead of milligrams on an answer okay that's just a not reading the answer get it um or not reading the question that's relatively trivial as long as you know you read the like you know when it says all but if you knew the answer, but you just put the wrong answer down, I wouldn't worry about that too much personally. That's just kind of like you were rushing or not paying attention. But if you had no clue and you still didn't have a clue afterwards, that's a problem. Everything's about learning and a lot of learning happens when you screw it up and then you figure out what you did wrong afterwards, just like with the assessments. So no other comments or questions on that. Okay, Barbara, you in here now? Uh, yes, sir. Did you get your name squared away on uh, uh, with the uh, school? Uh, no, I don't know who to email about it or call. Go to the Moreno campus and go to admissions. Okay. Online, write admissions. For some reason, it's not his fault. They put his email address as his name. So on the grade book, it shows, you know, Matthew, catch me, have me at funsex.com. You know, that's what his name shows up at. I need it to be his name. So. That's not the, that, that's, oh wait, that's the one you don't want to talk about, huh? Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> Blowing out the business model here, so. That OnlyFans link. 
All right. Uh, then you mentioned you said you could not link on. Did you uh, the videos as far as the assessment on JBL? Yeah, I was able to access it when I didn't go through Canvas. If I went to JBL separately. Yes, you can't go through Canvas. I don't know why I can't do it either. I've got to log off and go through on JBL. And uh, uh, so I'm glad you found the answer, but that's why I kind of put the pictures so you can kind of find yourself. So um, who did that? Who actually went and watched one of those videos? Jared, uh, which one did you watch? Chevy, I got you. I go with Jared. What did you see? Uh, I watched both of them. The, um, the, what was it? The shortness, what was it? The shortness of breath and the, I watched both of them. Now I can't remember what they, uh, they ALOC. were uh, named. The ALOC. Yeah, okay. the ALOC and the one between the fall and that other and one. The breathing problems? Yeah, the breathing problem. Yeah, assurance of breath. Okay, yeah. Okay, and uh, what impression did you get on that there as far as um, like watch? And let me, let me roll back at you a second. How many people didn't watch those? And show your hands. This isn't freaking, you know, because I want to know if you watched them, do they help? I imagine some of you will get more out of it than others, especially those of you that don't run first in calls. Well, the first one I said to look at was going to be, it was the, I wrote down here. I got to look at the page here. It was a GI bleed correction. It was the fall altered mental status. Yeah. Okay. So stand by. So before I go on, what I'm going to do is screen share that and watch it. All right. And kind of, again, like a real call. Think about assessing. You're not just watching it like a movie. You should be watching it like you're critiquing it. You are critiquing and analyzing this call. Okay. Like you're the preceptor and you're basically coaching this call. That's what you're going to get out of it. So this is 13 minutes. I'm going to make sure the audio, I got to set up the audio to make sure it gets the right plane here. Same as system. And share the screen. And I got a woman here in the baseball field in, in Washington Park, and she's, she's not feeling that well. She's, uh, I don't know what's wrong with her. Okay, I'm going to transfer you to the line of health EMS, the ambulance company. Okay. Okay. Everyone. Yeah, I got a woman who was in the park here. She's in Washington Park. She's not feeling well right now. Okay. What's the address of your emergency? Uh, it's Washington Park in Roseville. It's uh, right off of Central Avenue. Okay. All right. Uh, What's your phone number in case we get disconnected? My phone number is... Uh, On this next call, we're going to watch how... Are we just listening, sir, or we're supposed to be watching, too? ...year old female who... Is possibly having heat exposure. I'm just listening. Back to the actual problem. It's supposed it's to be seeing it. Did you see it now? Listening to the radio. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks yes, for sir. asking. I don't know what you could see. Problem that supposedly was reported usually by lay people, and really taking your assessment skills and putting them to work when you actually arrive. Um, So the part of this call that you don't see is how the fire department arrived first and two EMTs have already begun a detailed assessment. They've already checked vital signs and began the process of gleaning the information that was correct. They got this patient off the ground and onto a chair as you see her now and they've already gotten a set of vital signs. Nothing really that impressive, 
Her blood pressure was 102 over 60 and a, blood, and a pulse of about 120. Now that's a little bit high, but it's hot outside. This calls for a possible heat exposure. So you would expect maybe that to be going on. Notice how she is drooping in that chair. She has just got a lack of energy. That's a very important clinical sign. Right as you first walk up, that initial team size up could be everything. And that's telling you that she just doesn't have enough energy to kind of even sit up or even stand. Okay, you guys hear me okay? Sir. So yes, sir. Yes, sir. At this call here, he gave you two vital signs. I don't know if you've been watching her breathing or not, but what do they get? A BP of 102 over something and a pulse rate of 120. All right. So what he, he kind of mentions those as being mildly out of whack and it's warm outside. And I'm looking at the weather out there, looking at the guys in the uniforms. No one's really sweating much. It doesn't look like it's miserably hot. It's like a late afternoon call. So what do those vital signs tell you right off the bat? I mean, what can they tell you? About the BP, let's start BP first. She has a low cardiac output. Um, her body's probably compensating for a low fluid. Okay, so um, step back. Is that BP higher or lower than normal? Well, we don't know because we haven't asked her. Okay, that was going to be the next question, Hector. You kind of jumped ahead of me on that there, but taking mm -hmm. the traffic as a whole. If you took 100 BPs out there and a woman her age group, how many of them would you expect to have a blood pressure of 102, say, versus 130? Probably, probably not many of them, unless depending on what medications they take. Probably not a lot. So the first thing I want to call your attention to is it's not normal. And when I say normal, I'm not talking ideal. I'm talking the average, okay? So my first thought is, oh, yeah, I might ask like what Hector said. You know, some point in the conversation early on, I'm thinking her BP's low or than normal. If that's what she has every day, great. I wish I had that BP. But what's her pulse rate? Uh, 120. 120. 120 is arguably more abnormal in a sitting person than a BP of 102. So say her heart rate was 70 and her BP was 102 over whatever. I wouldn't think too much was going on as much as when I see a lower than average BP and a higher than average pulse rate. Do you follow me there? Yes, sir. So, this isn't a diagnosis, but when you're assessing someone, just like he cued you in on her posture and that how a general kind of slumped over look she has and the very fact that they found her on the ground, which is the part that's kind of not shown here, um, then I'm looking at, oh, back to what Robert said. Her BP seems like it's low, and her pulse rate may have increased to offset that somehow. Don't have the whole picture. But if her BP is indeed lower than normal, then it shows that there's some decompensation going, whether it's through dehydration or whatever. With Hector's question, I might ask her, hey, ma'am, does your blood pressure normally run low, normal, or high? And get that out of the way right away. Kind of make sense? And then yes, totally paying attention to a respiratory thing. So this is what I'm trying to get to. That's why I'm interrupting is there's key points in the assessment that you want to start flagging right away. Like walking into a crowd of people who stands out, who's dangerous, who do I worry about? Who's suspicious to me? And you look at vital signs and findings the same way. What's not right about this. I need to make sure it's just aberrant or it's actually a problem. Notice how quickly this crew is moving. Mark and Mike know that they're not exactly sure why this person has an altered mental status. Sure, it could be just a matter of heat, but be careful. She's got an altered mental status. So all of a sudden, anything is possible in that list of differentials. A-E-I-O-U tip. That's the acronym that I use to think about those things that can cause you a change in level of consciousness or even causes of possible seizures. 
you know where you're at right now? Medical problems, good question. Do you have epilepsy? Do you remember when your last teacher was? Bing, 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 bing. Just found out a huge piece of information. This patient is an epileptic. Oh, okay. Is this really about a heat exposure or did this patient have a seizure and now she's just postictal? I love calls like this. You can't figure it out. Probably the hospital won't be able to figure it out. She's probably hot. She's probably a little dehydrated anyway, but she might have had a seizure and she has a history of seizures. Now the key is to make sure we don't get caught in any other little problem, like perhaps maybe that she's got a heart attack going on and that's what caused her to have the, the change in level of consciousness. So you can't get lost in that. You can't just assume that it's just a seizure or just the heat. She has an altered level of consciousness. Back at you. As a medic student, when you're doing your scenarios, and this is going to be for the rest of the year, and when you go to ride outs, it's not going to be quite this easy. He's doing a good analysis, but let's go back to kind of basic things starting from the top. We did our scene safety thing. You see, no, essentially, did anyone see any real hazards with it? You had fire on scene first. Anything to kind of jump out of the whack there, right? So with the first presentation you had on this girl, how many of you are thinking that she's a serious patient, a critical, you know, kind of like you're on the clock or We'll start with the general impression. General impression, Zachary Torres, what's your general impression of her? She looks like she's altered, like she could be dehydrated. So I wouldn't say that. If I, general impression, she wouldn't be severe to me. Okay, so she doesn't seem severe to you. Now, altered means kind of a lot of things, right? So let's reword that. If I go to Visa and he's saying, hey, I've got a 56 year old female, who is altered or what might be a better word to describe her that paints the picture better if you're calling a hospital? Postictal. Postictal is an assumption based on seizure, but the same thing would confused. Stupor. Is she confused? Just slightly confused and maybe slow to respond. Okay. A GCS. So if you just give a GCS of 14, does that mean her eyes are closed and open only to pain? Or does it mean her motor is purposeful? Or does it mean she's confused? She's confused. Don't ever just give a 14. That's bullshit. Give it in people talk. Hey, you know what? We've got this woman at the park. We found her lying on the ground. She appears confused. She's a little tacky, seems hypotensive. Bam. A little confused or confused. Would you agree that describes her a more like user-friendly way? Yes. ABC wise. Are there any threats? Did you notice this as uh, obviously rapid or obstructed or problems with their breathing? Just a rapid pulse. Yeah, did you, if you, I don't see any breathing issues. I haven't had a really good look, but nothing's jumping out of me, right? So get general impression. We don't know her skin signs. And as far as the pulse of BP, those are still issues. I'm gonna ask you this. How many post patients have you run on? A lot. Uh, an accelerated pulse rate, accelerated respiratory rate is pretty common with them, right? Yes. Yes, sir. How many of them are yes, hypertensive sir. because they're postictal? Uh, all of them. Really? I, hypertensive I, I, or hypotensive? Hypotensive. Uh, I've had the, quite a few hypotensive postictal patients. Okay. So we'll leave that out there. This is where your personal experience comes in. With me, hypotension isn't really a factor, but I definitely expect it to be a little tacked out, you know, especially depending on when they had the seizure. Backing up just a little bit, how long does the postictal phase last? Um, just from experience, minutes. probably somewhere, yeah, somewhere between like 10, 15 to even 30, 45 minutes. Got gotcha. you. It just depends on the person. So we have the luxury of being in a TV show here 
the dispatch came down as this chick was out, assuming there's a 10 minute feed through between the call taker taking the call, getting the questions, alerting the appropriate units, running those units out there, get into the scene and do an assessment. If she's posted till that long, definitely a possibility. But one of the kind of features about postictal patients is normally they improve as time goes on. So again, looking at this like as a call from an assessment is first off, load and go, critical, not critical. I'm with you at this point. Yeah, something's wrong, but I'm not gonna just jump into the hospital and go because I really don't know what the hell's going on. But it doesn't look like it's killing her at this point. As far as differentials, is it the seizure? Is it a postictal phase? Is it a combination of something? It may be a little more complex. And John, I'm going to start an IV. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. I like the way you asked her about doing the treatment. Notice how Mark is doing a great job of investigating what the problem actually is. This is a patient who is not yet completely alert and oriented. If she did have a seizure, she may be slow to be coming out of that seizure and may not be able to just clear her mind very quickly to know what's going on. She's disoriented. She could be disoriented just because she's dehydrated too. And so he's going to start an IV and give her some fluids as well. Notice how that interview is difficult to do. It's not the kind of thing we talk about in class that in real life, patients may A, change their story, or B, just really not release a lot of information. Remember how she was confused about what hospital she went to, even though this is a patient who probably has gone to the hospital a lot because she is an epileptic? Notice also how because she's an epileptic, we need to kind of investigate a little bit more if, she, if she's followed very carefully by, an, by a physician and if her levels or her uh, levels of dilantin or whatever medication she's using to control the seizures are changed, have been monitored or changing and her doses have changed. So check it out. Um, uh, Mark at this point is going to ask that question. Last time you learned to get your uh, levels checked, you just had your what? This morning. Aha! Uh -huh. Are you a diabetic? Remember, AEIOU tips. This is part of one of the things he's checking after he gets done with the IV. He's going to check the blood sugar off of the IV needle so he doesn't have to poke her again. Um, you will read different theories about whether that is good or bad, but it does prevent us from poking her again, and it does give us a range of accuracy for checking blood sugars that way. She says immediately no, but I want you to think about it when patients say that. You can't always trust everything they're telling you because they're disoriented. So you don't have any pain anywhere right now? No. Okay. Still not 100% sure what time you've been out. How long you've been out there for? No. Okay. I'm gonna call the hospital and let them know we're coming. Okay. We still haven't gotten to really figure out what the problem might be. And someone who's having an altered mental status for this long, you have to start thinking: Is there something else? Notice how Mark is trying to find out. Are you sure you don't have any pain anywhere else? Is there a headache? Blurred vision? 
Now we start going down the path of maybe we were having a stroke and that's why we're acting a little strange. So that's part of this picture and the list of differentials that you're going to have. In this case, probably not likely, but still questions we need to ask. Do you want any better with the oxygen on? A little bit. Okay. Sometimes oxygen just makes people feel better. They just breathe a little better or it clears their head up a little bit. And someone who's post-sictal, post i.e. someone who's just coming out of a seizure, their brain is a little bit cloudy. Their, their neurons just fired like crazy and that's what caused the seizure, right? So sometimes that helps out. And in fact, in this case, he's trying to check to see if that has done it, made any kind of a difference. Okay. We got a little bit of IV fluid going, so that'll maybe help a little bit, okay? You are going to have to find out when your patient urinated and defecated. That's part of your assessment in hydration and how the patient is actually digesting or not. In this particular case, Mark has just stumbled upon a very interesting finding. This patient has an ileostomy bag. So they don't defecate in the same way that a normal person might. They go into a bag. So he has to investigate that and check to see how full the bag is and when she's emptied it. How often do you change your bag? Okay, how much Okay, any thoughts from anyone so far? What do you see, what questions or what assessment things um, are missing that you could do and that could have probably been done really quickly on scene or even while they're in the unit uh, while the partner's getting them set up for a line and everything? Um, temperature. Okay. Maybe a stroke, stroke scale. Okay, good. Someone mentioned a stroke scale, right? I was thinking, yes, who, sir. who was it? Uh, boy? Where's the boat? Robert Poe. Uh, when you did a stroke oh, test on her, would you have had her stand on one foot and see if she could hold her balance? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that was, uh, again, I'm going to poke yeah. fun because that was like the craziest thing ever, forever. But let's go on and I'm going to switch the screen <laughs> no, here yeah. for a second because some of those things, and you'll get smart at this, is you can kind of do partial assessments. You can see she's too weak to stand on her feet. That was like, like Campbell when he was kind of going syncopal or he was out of it there. You know, basically get smart, figure out when you're going to do assessment steps. Now I'm going to go to the assessment sheet here because this is um, looking down at what they checked. Can you guys see that now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So remember, this sheet is like writing instructions on how to tie shoelaces. It's detailed because I'm trying to cover everything, but it's actually nothing exceptional. So running down real fast, general impression scene, patients, bystanders. When you came on scene, what do you think the firefighters on scene, what their affect was? Affect is referring to like how stressed out or how relaxed or chilled they are. Okay, TJ, LA County ran this fire. What would they have told you when you pulled up on scene? General weakness. Uh, dry weakness, okay. Take her to the hospital, PLS. Get the gurney closer, guys. <laughs> yeah, in general weakness, take her to the hospital. She's, sick. Uh, she's probably dehydrated. Okay. What's the age? Uh, we don't know. So I'm picking on this here is kind of like when you get on scene, you're going to, as a medic, this works for you sometimes, but it can lead you down a, a, a bad trend. You get on scene, it's fires there, like, oh, we ran this patient 50 times, this is bullshit. And you buy into that and they bail 
And because your mind has already been kind of set that way, it's almost like you put blinders on. You became prejudiced and now you're kind of blind. That's one of the hardest lessons to learn in EMS is when you get burned out is always be a little suspicious. Be careful that you're not missing something. Um, going down, we look at her immediate life threats. Um, they said they picked her off the ground. Say she was on the asphalt to her, or, or at, uh, uh, ground out there, that would be probably a possibility. Her AVPU, what was she? Oh, I think she was alert. She was alert. Alert, right? Now, as far as orientation, we can only do a kind of guess, but what would you guess her orientation was based on listening to the conversation? Probably like A and O, three, maybe three. two, depending. I'm thinking, yeah, person. She just seemed a little slow to answer or just kind of confused, so. Yeah, I, mean, I would think A and O times two, maybe three at most. Yeah, because he asked her uh, about what she went to the hospital for, and she couldn't remember, and it was just right. like a few years ago, I think. Okay, and uh, by the way, as a medic, uh, there was an RP that called this call in. Do you think it might be a good idea to, if that guy's hanging around? is to get someone to ask them, hey, what did you see? What was she doing? Was she convulsing? Was she tweaking? You know, how long is she down there? Basically kind of get some details that are important. Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that she suffered a fall, but no one was holding C-spine. Well, this is coming perfect. Uh, was that Bo? No, that's Aguilera. Aguilera. So that was something they never addressed. And this is still back in 2012, 2011 timeframe when backboarding was still like, well, it was just kind of getting uh, less popular. So that goes back to the RP. What'd you see? Um, what'd you clear? And so uh, this call is being pushed along as an altered LOC call, but why I'm spending time on this is altered LOC could be anything. It's like really, this is the kind of the bottomless pit of stuff. That's why you want to check stuff. So yeah, was a fall involved in it? Was she altered because she fell? Did she have a tonic seizure of keel over, have a seizure on the ground, and now she's gorked out? Did she have a seizure and she became heat stressed? Don't know. So those initial findings are big. So going on to her, uh, one of the easiest things, you don't have to put eyes up there. When you're looking at her, especially a frequent flyer, or say it was some bum or skanky looking dude or whatever, how hard is it to kind of take a look in their eyes and see if they're dilated, pinpointed, or something out of whack? Not hard. I'm not talking get your flashlight, do all this crap here, and do that. I just want to see is something out of whack. You could do a pupil check just by having them open their eyes in the light. The guy who was supposed to talk to you today, he had a patient just like that, had a blown pupil, but just mildly confused. It was a slow bleed. Took her down a desert. They basically got an argument and finally pushed her in a CT. She had a massive venous bleed, but she didn't look typical, but she did have a blown pupil. Markedly different. So looking at the eyes, it's part of your GCS and it kind of says, oh, geez, these are kind of pinpoint. Maybe she's gorked out on freaking pain meds. Maybe she's tacked out on MDMA. You don't know. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And the other thing is to try to be lazy as a medic. Though. The, the other thing is to be lazy as a medic. You want to do as many things as you can at once. So you know you're going to be looking at them, even standing them up and getting on the gurney or when you're talking to them. So you could do that eye check and like economically right then and there, trauma, non-trauma, medical, non-medical, doesn't matter. It gives you a good idea of what's going on along with your questions. Um, <clears throat> airway patency, she was clearly breathing. There was no, uh, no issue there. I like the way they started with what happened. Her breathing, we kind of cleared that. If you look at this, the deal, they gave the pulse, but no skin signs. And when you're taking a pulse rate, you should be checking skin signs right off the bat. Say she's heat exhausted, what skin signs did you expect? Flushed and dry. And uh, I think she would be. Diaphoretic. She's diaphoretic. Diaphoretic uh, and maybe pale. Okay. And tacky. Heat exhaustion. What are the signs? This is why I want you to write those cards out. Heat exhaustion. Classic signs are what? Diaphoretic. Uh, diaphoretic. Altered. 
uh, altered. Warm. Not warm. Cool and cool she's still cool. And then altered. If you took a temperature, their temperature might be a degree. But the diaphoresis and pallor of heat exhaustion patients is so classic that you get cool skin signs. They're cooling off. What yep. is the pulse rate on a heat exhaustion? Probably going to be tacky. tacky. Rapid. Okay. 120 is like a sweet spot. Perfect. I'm not saying this is what she is, but this is where those cards are recognizing the difference of things. Now, was she altered or is she confused? I mean, yeah. But if her skins are cool, all right, it's very unlikely she's a heat stroke. If you've ever felt the heat stroke, they're cooking, especially if you feel a central temp, all right? And you'd want to get a temp right away to tell that. Um, heat strokes don't look like anything, so they could be diaphoretic or dry. It doesn't really matter. Although in her case, exertional heat stroke, is it likely that she ran herself into a heat stroke running sprints around the field in gear? Or is she more likely the type to get a classic heat stroke where it slowly comes on and she gets overheated and now you're talking more dry skins? Right, just classic. classic. You guys make the sense out of this? It's kind of two and two. It's kind of like on a trauma. Do you think she crashed her motorcycle jumping hills or tripped over something and fell over? You kind of got to put the pieces together in the picture. Um, her pulse rate was fast. Her breathing's good. Uh, basically, her eyeballs, you can check all that looking at her. GCS will say 14. And then we don't know a lot except by the bystander history. There's nothing she's really complaining of. Did you notice how he's asking the questions about pain? How did he ask her about pain? Did he have a leading question with a, with a conclusion built into the question, or did he ask a question? He asked a question. Okay, what did he say? He said, are you sure? I think, the, well, I think the second question he asked was on the way to the hospital, he said, are you sure you don't have any pain? I heard something similar. You don't have any pain, do you? Do you have any pain anywhere? Or you don't have any pain anywhere, do you? I kept hearing the negative in the question, which for a baby, they're gonna tell you anything. For an altered patient or confused patient where you're trying to be really accurate, Leading questions will get you the answers you want to hear as often as not. A better thing to ask is, are you having any pain or discomfort anywhere? That's open-ended. If you're trying to play tough guy, Jarek, you don't have any pain anywhere, do you? No, nowhere, anywhere. Where's, where's, where's uh, uh, the sh uh, shock man, Campbell, where are you? You're not feeling lightheaded or sick, are you? No. No, sir. No, I'm not at all. Okay. Ask open questions. <laughs> I'm teasing you, but I'm not. It's actually, again, a, a freaking amazing call. I just wish uh, the filming hadn't stopped because it would have been really good to get the transition when you woke up and started answering questions. Um, then kind of going down, and now you can tell he's fishing. So what vital signs did he get? He got a blood pressure. No heart rate. A heart rate. Um, obviously he's writing down the other crap on his, on his, uh, on his clipboard. Um, did, uh, how long did it take for him to get a blood glucose level? Thank you. Too long. A while, but he got an IV, so yay, get a, get a, get a stick. Why was he giving her IV fluids? He, he, felt like she, was, she was probably a little dehydrated. Probably, right? Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but kind of like some t sometimes starting an IV is what you do when you don't know what else to do as a medic. You should have a reason for that IV access. If you think, oh yeah, she's probably heat exhausted, she's probably dehydrated, but there, and I can't, obviously the call is a video thing, so we don't know everything that's going on, but you should be kind of having an idea. Yeah, I'm starting a line because I plan to give her fluids, and if he gave her fluids, what do you think he should check next to see if? Lungs. Lung sounds. Her vital signs again. Reassess vitals. Exhausted. Yeah, reassess the vitals. 
reassess the vitals. What would you expect your pulse rate and BP to do if the if fluid was an issue? Uh, or BP go up a little bit and then maybe bring the pulse down a little bit. Yeah, definitely. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. If, if he gave her those, those fluids and nothing changed and she still doesn't kind of come out of it or seem to be getting better in LOC, uh, just like the, uh, the talker was saying, now you start to get like, well, shit, what else is going on? And who mentioned getting a stroke assessment right away? Uh, I did, sir. Yeah. So off the bat, do you think you could check her grips and drift pushes really easily, right? You yes, sir. Her speech was slurred without asking a single word. Could you check her proprioception or pronator drift? Yes, yes sir. The only thing that might be sketchy with her, but she's a perfect candidate, is asking her about repeating a phrase. Because her answers have been confused, now you want to kind of be sure, is our answer, are they confused, or is she unable to speak? Articulate a sentence. Sounds like she can articulate the sentence. It's just a little slow. All right, well, again, Check or guess. If you're not assessing, you're guessing. So definitely check. And um, the other final thing that makes me not think she's a stroke is because her BP is low and her pulse rate's fast. So that, that would be kind of my disclaimers, but I'm still going to check because every time you're sure you know it, you're going to eat shit. Um, With a call like this, sir, would you want to check for like the short-term memory and like ask them to try to remember something and then ask them the same question like five minutes down the road? Yeah. 10 minutes down the road. If you find out, like you introduce yourself, hey, my name's Tony. We're going to take you to the hospital. We're taking you to whatever, West Western Med. And then a couple minutes later, hey, what's my name? Huh? You know where we're taking you? You know where we're taking you? So is that assessing or GCS also a reassessment of vitals? Yes, sir. A lot of people don't think of it that way. They get the initial GCS and that's the end of it. But if she's a TIA, a concussion, a post patient, in general, don't they get better as time goes on? That's what you want to be thinking about. On um, the differentials down here, because we're doing the ALU tips here. Can you guys see the uh, screen with those? Mm, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. On these differentials, what what have you, you can you think is probably ruled out based on what you know so far? Um, alcohol, airway, uh, all the A's basically ruled out. Ammonia might be in there, actually. If you remember that video for the liver patient, remember the one we walked in there? With, with something like that, though, would they have, like, ascites? Sometimes. Wouldn't sometimes you be sometimes. able to see ascites or some kind of jaundice if they're at that point? Jaundice, maybe. Ascites, maybe. I'm just saying that based on what we can see, because I don't see her belly and we're seeing her from the back, I'm just saying I can't exclude that on this. But I'd be yes, comfortable sir. with blowing off the other with the other ones uh, right then. Uh, what about the uh, E side? Good roll out excited delirium. Um, I would get rid of the eclampsia and, and excited delirium. Okay. If she was 35 years old. Then eclampsia possibly if there's a possibility of pregnancy. Okay. Or immediately postpartum. It's incredibly rare, but yeah. they've had eclampsia occur up to 21 days after delivery, which kind of blows your mind because the cure for eclampsia or preeclampsia is to deliver the baby. So I'm not sure how the heck that works, but just so you don't put it out of the realm of possibility. What about the um, eye? I mean, she could, uh, she could be having a UTI, I don't know, infection. Okay, under the U part, yeah, but oh, oh yeah, no, for, uh, I mean, So maybe we don't know, but that's again where a temperature comes in and he was checking her urine and poop, right? What do you want to know about that if you're asking? How frequent. uh, frequency, color, uh, smell. <laughs> it's normal. Difficulty uh, burning. Yeah, burning. Yeah. Frequency and yeah, color. So if he's looking at her shit bag, you're going to kind of look, is there something really odd there? 
Um, it's not like exactly my favorite thing on earth to do, but if I'm really trying to check in things, that's something. Uh, the urine is, of course, if we're looking for anything else we're looking for, is there a change in frequency? If she could tell you, you got to consider, are you peeing more often than normal? Make it simple questions. Like a kid could answer and then work your way from there. Overdose, what do you think about that? Um, probably I mean, not. I, don't think so. I mean, it is possibly yeah, depends on what medication she's taking. Home. Six to one, half dozen of the other, don't know, right? Uremia, uh, yeah. someone mentioned that as a yeah. possibility. Uh, you, and, uh, what would the uremia be from? Diabetes. Let me run that back. Uh, any uh, problems you need today? I don't pee. Oh, like the renal so failure? The dialysis. Uh, yes, RD. You guys follow me there? Yes, sir. It's one thing to say uremia. It's another thing to know what causes uremia in the standard profile. So uremia that we're looking for is due to renal failure. And mm -hmm. renal failure patients that develop uremia typically don't pee. That's why they have to go to dialysis. The kidney's not working. So when you're saying these terms, that's why I'm kind of going over them, is thinking there's more to the word, more to it than just a word. And as you get better, you'll kind of pick up on this. Um, and if she's not telling you about dialysis because she's altered, what would your physical assessment want to check for? To look for a fistula. Look for the shunts, right? The big, uh, where they have on the arms is classic. And where's the other ones located? Subclavian. Subclavian, torso, any place in that area. So that's where physical assessment on altered patients is considered the standard of care. You're not going to strip and flip every patient. But if you've got issues, you may definitely want to look, uh, especially if they're critical, because you find missing stuff. That's when you're kind of doing that head to toe uh, palpation bit. Okay, underdose withdrawals. Brooke, you're being all quiet back there. Um, What's your known history? I, I wasn't here for that part. My internet went out, so I'm on my phone. Sorry. Okay, well, this is something you got to, where no one's going to pick you up. We can't see you. Fox, what's your known history? Victor, Marietta. Yes, sir. What's her known history? And then, sorry, say that again, I can't hear you. What is her known medical history? Oh, for that patient, the known medical history was, um, and I'm blanking. TJ. Uh, epilepsy. Epilepsy. Epilepsy, and she's got an ileostomy. Yeah, epilepsy. Okay. Those are two things we know. All right, when I, when it, my computer cut out, did she say diabetes too, or did she yeah. not have diabetes? That's when you check the blood sugar. Okay. So if she's got an ileostomy bag, which normally happens because of either she just got screwed up guts from the Crohn's or, or, or cancer, she has epilepsy, and if epileptics keep seizing, what does that tell you about the dosing of their medication? It's not it's correct. Not working too low. Under dosing. Okay. Or for blood to sugars through the roof, and she's a known diabetic. Under dosing of her meds. You kind of are you kind of picking up why I'm going through these piece by piece? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is why you need to pay attention to these things um, because even though it seems like a lengthy process now, once you understand this, it's actually pretty fast. You screen this quickly. So going on the stroke CVA, we did not do a stroke assessment. I mean, if she's a stroke, it doesn't look really bad, but basilar strokes, the ones in the back of your head, the deep central strokes are the ones that create kind of bizarreness and it's not just like, 
the really easy, you can't miss it unless you're a retard stroke. Okay, it's the subtle ones that you're screening and that's why you have those six screens there. And in particular, the speech repetition and the proprioception. Um, sepsis? Um, I mean, she could be having a UTI. Yeah. I don't know. What would you check to kind of help you with that determination? In fact, uh, skin yeah. signs and obviously her BP, her pulse. Hands, temp, urine output. Check her, her urine. urine. Okay. I'm gonna check her ileostomy bag. So would you guys agree that with her pulse rate and BP alone, we have a possibility of a bulimia issue? Uh, yeah. Okay. And if it resolves or gets better with fluids, then you know it's a bulimia issue. I mean, you could have also checked her end tidal CO2. And uh, if, it's, if it's low, then uh, that clearly indicates sepsis, huh? Not by itself. What is mm. the rate? Wait, what was that? The what is the rate? What are her lung sounds? Don't look at the CO2 by itself. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a rate, then a whole right. rate, that's like looking at her blood pressure and saying, oh, your blood pressure is 102 over 60. You're in hemorrhagic shock. <laughs> I can't say that. Yeah. Right. It's a tachypneic. Um, was that you who was, who was saying that? Tachypnea, yeah, that's not mentioned, and we don't really know. Uh, she's clearly not labored breathing, so you'd have to kind of watch her silent to see what's going on. Now, what do you think might indicate that her pulse rate is due to temperature outside? How do you kind of prove that, if you will? Uh, her skin signs? Well, what do they move her into? The ambulance. The yeah. ambulance, yeah. Down. I bet those guys were in white shirts. What a shitty job. I'd hate to do that. You get things on them all the time. Um, if you move her into a cool area and she starts to cool off and slow down her pulse rate, is that a pretty good sign that maybe temperature playing a role in that pulse rate? Yes, sir. Do you see what a cooling is a treatment? And if it's a heat stroke, cooling will affect their LOC as well. Yes, sir. Uh, so this is kind of the look here. So sepsis is possible, and because she has a, B, a lower BP and we have a relatively fast heart rate, a lot of things can cause that. Anything that affects the BP can cause that. Okay, uh, would you say she's in shock at this point? Um, she could be compensating a little. Anyone want to calculate or map? You guys were spitting it out so much the other day. See what you could do. Uh, it was, what was her vitals again? One oh something. I want you to play with the vital signs. 102 over 60. Perhaps 74. 80. Uh, 74. Uh, 74 on the map. Okay, so what is it? Uh, systolic plus two times diastolic pressure. Over three, yeah, one, four. Yeah, one, one, 120 over 102. 160. 224 divided by three is 74. Wait, her blood pressure was 102 over 60. So that's going to be 162 6. divided by three is what? 74. <laughs> it's going to be about 50 something. Unless I got my arithmetic completely wrong. So 60, 60 times 2 is 120 plus 102 is 122. So what's her systolic blood pressure? Oh, my goodness. What's her systolic BP? Divided by 3 two. is 74. 102. 102 plus her diastolic, which was 60, equals 162, correct? Yeah, but you have to do your diastolic times 2, I thought. Oh, you're right. You're right. Thank you. That was it. My bad. So, see, so it's two, 222 divided by 3 is 74, sir. Okay. And what's the sort of map you want to have? Uh, you want to be in between 70 and 110? I don't know. I don't care. Map is 70 and 110, ideally <laughs> for perfusion, uh, 55 to 65. That's minimal perfusion, kidney perfusion. I believe 50 to 60 is the mean, minimum when your basically renal function starts to get killed. So – just for shits and giggles that you guys are squawking about MAP all the time, and it's not a bad thing to be aware of. And on your monitor, it calculates it automatically if you're working with a 12 or the Zoles. Um, you might want to keep an eye on that, but you could see with her BP, her MAP is at the very bottom end. 
I know that without calculating the map, just because I basically get a good sense of BP ranges. But I don't, I would not put her in the, in the position of shock at this point. Not with what I see again. Um, hypothermia, likely or unlikely? Unlikely. Um, unlikely. unlikely. She's, out in the hot, she's out in the heat. Hypo, hyponatremia. Possibly. Possible. Dehydration. Well, she, if she, I, I put it to outside realm because you have to drink a lot of, you know, uh, hypotonic water, basically water to do that. But, you know, and uh, hypoxia. Unnecessarily. Oh, no. She wasn't, uh, fine. Has no. been your way. wasn't cyanotic or anything. So. You go with a gut check on that. I'm going with you. I don't think cyanosis is an issue. They wouldn't have been looking at her like that if she was. Hypoglycemia clearly is not the issue because they checked it. Plus, when people are hypoglycemic, they tend to get worse, not better, unless they're treated. Um, hyperthermia, we don't know. Um, hyperkalemia, we don't know. Uh, they never took, they never did an EKG on her, so. I, could, I was looking at the monitor. I couldn't see if they had her connected or not. Did you, could you see cables? Uh, I don't, I, I, don't didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even see a four lead. Yeah, that I don't think they did on uh, EKG. That is like crazy. Uh, if nothing else, because monitoring her pulse rate is way easier if you're watching the monitor than trying to take repeat vital signs yourself. Okay. And uh, if you have uremia, how does that tie in with the possibility of hyperkalemia? If you don't get dialysis, you can have your uh, you're gonna be hyperkalemic. T waves on the monitor. Electrolyte okay. imbalance. If you're lucky, God loves you, you might get those beautiful peaked symmetrical T waves on the monitor. If you see them, definitely pay attention. Just don't count on them being the only indicator. Uh, what else could cause hyperkalemia? Um, if you have, uh, if you're acidic, if you have too many hydrogen atoms outside. A dietary intake? If you eat too much of it? She had a yeah, bunch of bananas. Be it. Any other causes that's more likely uh, with the uh, stuff we've gone through here? Somebody already say sepsis. Sepsis, uh, does that normally cause hyperkalemia? No. Hyponatremia? Your primary causes are of, uh, of uh, diabetes. Kidney failure. But that's not yeah, I mean, because. So we already kind of got the kidney failure aspect, right? If she's a dialysis patient, then hyperkalemia is a possibility. The other two big ones is because she's profoundly hyperthermic whether it's through drugs, like the case you had this morning with that 24-year-old uh, uh, chick, okay? And in the actual case, they had to, uh, they had to basically put her under to cool her off with dantrolene and force cooling because her potassium was climbing to the point of causing her to go into arrest. Why is that happening? Why do you think the heat stroke or drug-induced hyperthermia leads to hyperkalemia? Your kidney function start to fail? Uh, not directly. Uh, the same thing happens if you have a crush injury, severe um, um, like a histamine release. Oh, is it because like you're? It's, it's kind of affecting the sodium potassium pump. Nope. Where is most potassium kept in your body? Inside the cell. Inside of the cells, and what constitutes most of the cells in your body? Wait, what was that? What 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 is the cell type you have most of in your body, unless you're Grillo? Endothelium. Muscle. Yep. <laughs> Muscle cells. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a direct correlation between heat stroke and fatality and muscle mass. And your uh -huh. muscles get hottest the fastest. Muscles are what keep your temperature where it is now. If you have no muscle, you get cold. <clears throat> And right, you shiver. shiver to make temperature. Right. So if your muscles get overheated, they're going to be almost the first things to overheat. And if they die, <coughs> those so-called gates break down, and all that intracellular potassium—it's like the gremlins; they're cut loose into the circulation. Oh, okay. You guys following that? There's a sequence to everything. 
Yeah. So if you kill a whole bunch of cells, that's one of the reasons they would say if you put a tourniquet on, you can't take it off because as soon as you pop the tourniquet, the person will just code. And you actually do see that with crush injury, someone stuck under something for a long time, they lift it and they die. It's a massive potassium, acid, God knows everything. All the dogs are out, all the, all the animals are loose from the zoo. Don't we give a medication for crush injuries for that reason, sir? You can give them insulin, potassium, and bicarb, and calcium. But one of those things that, honestly, if you run this call, ask for a shock trauma team from a local hospital, have their asses flown out there, intubate them, central line them, monitor them, and then basically as you undo the compression, they are treating. Because as medics, we just don't have the tools. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, is that yeah. something to do rhabdo? That's what I mean about rhabdo. When you have rhabdo, in an isolated rhabdo, you just destroy the muscle. But if you have widespread rhabdo, you release potassium into the system and it can cause hyperkalemic arrest. But don't you also release protein as well with that? Yes, that's what kills the kidneys later on. Jesus. That's how it comes in the urine. Yes, protein doesn't hurt your kidneys when you eat it because when you eat protein, it gets broken down to itty bitty little amino acids that's why that whole thing about excessive protein intake damage your kidneys are full of shit. What about creatine? When you break down muscles, you're letting loose entire proteins. It's like letting loose watermelons instead of small little grapes into your system. Kidneys <laughs> are good at handling grapes, the amino acids. They cannot handle watermelons coming through the filtering system. So that's uh, why you give the sodium and the fluids, in particular the fluids. Yeah, it makes sense. So, Is that why they have like the hurt team fly out sometimes and just the amputate in the field as opposed to trying to save that appendage due to rhabdo and compartment syndrome? I, I can't speak to that. It, uh, I believe that is – what does hurt team stand for, by the way? I don't know. I haven't heard it before. I, I don't know the exact verbiage, but I know in L.A. County and I think at Loma Linda they have the hurt team too that just for field amputations – I've never heard the team named that, but I know Joe uh, Jeff Robinson, he called one for that, for a dozer that trapped a guy on San Tim. And Jeff is an EMT basic, but he's fucking smart, and he's a goddamn competent fire captain on top of it. And uh, he was the one who said, hey, where do they get a team? You don't just medevac people with a helicopter. You can get a team brought out to you if it's going to be a prolonged call. You always got to keep that in the back of your head. Oh, this guy's way over the hell my, my head. And as you know, if you pull them loose, like you separate whatever the equipment is, the dude's going to just die on you. <laughs> so that's where you call the basic trauma team from the hospital. And uh, Joanna, you were saying something about that. Um, yeah, it's just a hospital emergency response team. And then it'll be like a physician and an RN um, that will go out there if if there's like a major trauma where they can't get the patient out and then they can do like um like field amputations or like yeah so if you give a report on this call say you're the guy on this call martin zavala and you find that tj was driving home and got trapped where only his freaking chest is sticking out from underneath the car and he's kept alive basically because the car is serving as a giant tourniquet from the chest down. You might want to call a hurt team, whatever your local trauma center is. Say, hey, we've got this, you know, 28 year old male weighing approximately, do you want me to make you fat or thin? We'll call him 90 kilograms. And he's not uh, trapped, 20. trapped under a vehicle with complete occlusion of his chest. And we can't get him out without fear of him going into collapse. That we got IVs established. We need you guys here. They might bring an anesthesiologist. They might bring out a little more kit than a fucking pair of saw and scissors. You want them to come out to RSI meds. You want them to come out with basically, if you give them an idea of what they're supposed to do, they can prep a little bit better before they leave. And that is part of your report too. Give the essentials. Now, is uh, every trauma hospital have one of those, or is that just a very specialized team? Any hospital can put together some people and float them out there. Even local hospitals, I've had them bring out there. That comes down to what's their shift, their staffing, is a nurse agree to go with you, is there an ambulance available, blah, blah, blah. 
But if you have a trauma center, by virtue of their designation, they have to have pretty heavy resources available. So unless they're on internal disaster, they can almost always scrounge some poor medical slob, you know, third year resident to go out there and do something. So this is, this is a, it's a matter of how many people the hospital has available. Because like a nurse can say, I don't want to go. You can't make them go. That's kind of like a, 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 a mercy mission. Most of them will want to go just because it's different and fun. So uh, a different. So coming back to, again, the whole idea, I'm trying to get you to think this way. Uremia is on one side of the paper, and I don't care which chart you use, E for electrolytes. Kalemia is going to be on some other letter, but they can be closely related. Hyperthermia or hypothermia can both cause, oh, kidney failure and hyperkalemia. All of these things play into each other. If it's not sinking in your head now, this is again why you kind of got to look at these and take some moment and try to think up an example. When I teach EMTs, I'd say, okay, what's an example of an A? Not just tell me alcohol, give me an example. Ditto for medics when you're doing your H's and T's. Okay, blah, 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 H's and T's. What is an H? That's an ion. What is an H? That's a hyper this or a hyper that. Because if you don't think that way, I guarantee you, you will not think that way on scene. What is that saying about practice as you train or whatever, something? Practice you know, as you preach. That's one of them. But it's something about the way you train is the way you'll perform. I know Robert knows that. You will sink down to your level of lowest level of competence. So if you don't train well, and even mentally, like, you'll be a dipshit. Yeah, practice like you play. Perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah, that's another one. Just practice by itself makes permanent. You practice bad habits, all you do is make them permanent. So oh, yeah. hyperthermia, hyperkalemia, hyperventilation, uh, HHS. <clears throat> I didn't put DK in there because generally DK doesn't cause you to be altered, but it is a differential in there. Trauma and toxins. So again, I saved another PowerPoint for you because you see lots of versions of the AIU tips or AIU shit or whatever, because there's so many things that can go wrong. And instead of trying to memorize a hundred different things, think about how they all have, what they have in common. All righty. Um, so I want to go back here because I, I haven't watched the whole video here. I want to see what he says. Anyone I want to add anything before I go on? Brian, Jared. Grillo. Grillo, what sort of medical history does she have that we know about? Epilepsy. Is that it? And, and other stuff. I just, you know, I'm given the opportunity to the other students to, to pitch in. <laughs> yeah, All right. So if you're assessing patients in the field and you pay that sort of attention, you're going to have a really miserable time of it. Dude, what a team player. Hey, there's no I in team, huh? <laughs> there is a me. Notice how Mark is going down the path of investigating whether this patient. There, we can't see the video. Damn it, sorry. I'm now watching it just fine. A little bit more in detail. Uh, and grips are certainly part of it. But remember, we're trying to rule out all those things that are part of AEI. There you go, thank you. My apologies, so it picked up right here. I didn't want it to be off for it. Okay. Try and break it. Try and break it. Whoa. Take your dead out. Notice how Mark is going down. The audio is pretty bad, by the way. I know that just can't like help that they're recording it in the unit. Now checking his neurological exam in a little bit more in detail. Hand grips are certainly part of it, but remember, we're trying to rule out all those things that are part of AEIOU tips, and one of them is the potential that she could be having a stroke. And here we are thinking dehydration, heat-related illness, or maybe just a seizure, and we miss the big one. 
that's why the differentials usually can have to are going to have to stay wide and that means having a lot of different differentials when you have an altered mental status patient who's not a reliable historian no. he's desperate he's asked about headache like three times now so just to put something together when you say keep a wide differential it sounds like complicated language it's basically another way of saying don't tunnel in just be honest and say i don't know what's wrong with her i can i've checked these things but there's a lot of other things that i will never be able to prove so differential is another way of saying keeping an open mind well we're almost there okay Sometimes we will not know the punchline, even after we do a bunch of tests. It's going to be really hard for the hospital to determine whether the patient actually had a seizure or not, and whether the patient, patient's dehydration or heat-related issues are the cause of her feelings or her, her illness right now. So sometimes it's kind of less than satisfying. You can't really solve the crime that you're being sent to solve. Uh, you can be a detective and sometimes find kind of a smoking gun, like a high blood sugar or maybe, you know, really strange uh, electrolytes that the hospital might find on a blood test. And that could really kind of cinch the diagnosis. But sometimes we just don't know. Okay, so now for a quick quiz. Same call, Brian Ferguson. Get on scene, you find the chick like she is, you run a temperature, and uh, um, you get a temperature of 106. What's your treatment? Cool her down. How? Uh, we can use ice packs, get her in the back of the ambulance, get some AC going. Okay, um, do you work in an ambulance right now? No, I do not. Okay, do you, where do you work now? The, the house. What's the house? I don't, I, don't, I don't work. Oh, you don't have, like, you're not working at a place that's like a clinic or some shit? Okay, just going out there, how many ice packs do you guys carry in your ambulances? Four at most. Probably, yeah, like four, four to six. Uh, how, how long do they melt and you have to change them? Like no, I say uh, we have uh, they're not ice packs. They're the the cold packs. Those uh, we have to pop them. Oh yeah, they're not ice packs. They're so, little packs. Yeah. Those are great. I love those. They are great for a drink. They're great for a freaking sprained ankle, but they are not effective at cooling anyone down. Um, now that you you just made me do it, I'm gonna have to do it. Added a homework assignment. You're forcing me to hunt down the paper, which compares methods of cooling. Got you. Uh, ice packs. Got you. Why? The one with little cubes in them that melt down and turn into water bags after a day in your unit that no one carries unless you're on a fire engine. They are about as effective as letting the patient sit there. If you have to cool someone down emergently, Fox. Sterile water and a blanket. Why sterile? I don't know, that's all we carry. Uh, water, any water. Just water. pour water, right. just pour Thanks, water man. on them. Get fire to get you some ice and water. Just pour it on top of them. Yes. Just get the, get just hose. pull the, uh, just pull the fire hose out, so, fire okay. extinguisher. What is the objective? <laughs> when you come out of the water at the beach or a lake and you step out into a breeze, how cold are you when that happens? Pretty cold, pretty cold. Daily. Okay. So evaporative cooling. You need to have moving air, ideally cooler moving air, and then even if you pull a Zavala and pee on them, you're still going to get cooled off. Exactly. You want evaporative cooling, so you wet them down and get them in the coolest, breeziest air. So if you're in an ambulance, you're pretty much set, unless you're in a broken ambulance where the AC is shot to shit. And so get him in another ambulance or you get him wet and fan him. Do the Maharaja thing. Fan him. If you're in a fire engine out in the field on a bush engine and you go out on someone who goes down, what does every type one fire engine carry on it? I say a fan. Ice chest. Fan. I was a big fan. Fan, ice chest. Just pour that thing on top of you. Get the ice chest, get the fan, 
get the water and put the PPV on them and start blowing them dry if you don't have a good breeze. You will cool someone down very quickly, almost as fast as if you put them in a cold water immersion. Faster is better. Ditch the ice packs on the crotch unless you've got nothing else to do. You actually have ice packs or you want to, you don't know what else to do except grope around their genitals. But make sure you start actual cooling first, then throw the other crap in their axilla, on their wrist, and their groin, whatever. But by themselves, they don't do shit. And what do you do when you cool someone down? As you're cooling them down, what do you want to keep checking? The temperature. Vitals and temp. And what's the Panel status. What? Did you really? The mental health? status too. You said health status or mental status? Mental status. Oh, got you. Okay, good. So mental <laughs> status is clear. And um, um, recheck the temp. How cool do you want to get them down before you stop back to cooling? Once it starts shivering, you want to kind of just slow it down? No, that's like saying. Oh, I think like, yeah. oh should only be a couple degree oh, drop. Right? You don't do the birth control yeah, by hanging out after, do you? <laughs> that's pretty much what you just said. You He's stop. got a bunch of kids. <laughs> yes, you're going to have a lot of kids. I don't uh, think I should stay pregnant. I wait till after. Then I put the condom on. So that's a pretty bad on. idea. He's the one writing the reviews online saying nothing works. <laughs> cool them down. Uh, I don't know. You check their temp, and when you get them down to about 102, 101. A fever is okay. But if you overcool them and they start to shiver, what's going to happen to the temperature? It's going to go back up. Go back up. Right back up. And if that oh, happens, yeah. because say someone on scene did it, then you could treat that shivering like a seizure and give them Versed to stop the seizures, uh, the shivering. I mean, the seizures, okay? That's basically the only way to stop them from shivering because you don't want the temp to go back up. You guys follow me so far? Cooling, yes, sir. Cooling is a treatment. Then you do your fluid boluses and other stuff like that. Any ideas why you would do the fluid boluses to someone whose temperature, going back to Ferguson, uh, was 107 degrees? Uh, to replace the fluids they lost. Okay, maybe the, the fluids they lost, that could be, what if they didn't lose fluids? Say they were like that chick who took a bunch of MDNA and just a super, super hot and combative. What happens when you cook muscle cells and gut cells? Oh, uh, they leak the electrolytes. They leak the electrolytes. And the electrolyte that we have in, that we're worried about in particular? Potassium. 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 Potassium bananas. So we need to give the kidneys every chance to regulate the levels by giving plenty of fluids, making sure the urinary output is good. And then if they also have, I forget who mentioned it, proteins like myoglobins in the urine, help protect the kidneys from getting jacked up because of that. The kidneys are like the heart. They're super sensitive. They can be traumatized and go into permanent failure from one single overdose or hypothermic episode. So we gotta protect those like we protect, protect the brain. Any questions on the sequence here? Is this making sense at all? Slowly. And the other thing, of course, uh, Ferguson, is if you get her combative and hot and altered, what are you gonna check as far as the rest of your AIU tip stuff? Uh, pupils? Everything. Glucose, BP, basically the whole gamut, all the vital signs. Okay. If you check everything, you're not going to miss anything you should know. You may not recognize it, but at least you'll be checking. And if you check them once, you should be checking them again. Reassessment counts. All right. So far on that, now we come up on this chick, and um, what was the other one I had that she was going to be? Eh, can't think of it. Okay, so uh, questions or comments? All right. If what did you guys think looking at the video for those of you that have not watched one of these videos from beginning to end? How much do you think you can learn from these videos? If you put up the assessment sheet, and you start kind of going along with them, 
and basically doing your own parallel assessment. Do you think you can learn anything? I think it would help. Yeah. I watched, um, the, I watched the cardiac arrest one and did yeah. that. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's, you know, it's just nice to kind of go through the stuff and just run through the steps. And just little things you can kind of look at where you don't, when you're running a call, um, when you're working, running a call, you don't really see, you know, like as far as like bagging so, or uh, ventilating somebody, you know, or just yeah. seeing some aspirate. Just like little things you kind of make notes of. One of the kind of bad things about being an EMT on an ALS unit is if you have a critical call, you're usually busy. Sometimes you're just so focused on doing what you got to do that you don't kind of see the big picture. You don't have the luxury of standing back and watching. It's like kind of being a firefighter in a hose. You're not in a good position to do a good size up, to kind of figure out a strategy. You're mainly figuring out shit like, can I get my BA mask on? Did I forget my helmet strap? What's my nozzle setting? Which is my point of entry? Oh shit, the hose is stuck on something. You know, whereas if you're sitting back, you can see a lot more. And, uh, and sometimes the botched up calls are much better to learn from. So I'm hoping you take advantage of this. And this is, I wanted to walk you through a video. We'll do one more here. And I wanna see how many people get this one right. I'm just gonna let it, uh, uh, see what you think. Okay, I'm going to turn you over to a light and help me or not, so I'm going to help you until I'm able to ride. Okay. Ambulance. Hi, I can't breathe, like, how are you swallowing? Okay. All right, do you have an ambulance on the way? Can you confirm your address for me? It's Club Honey, Manoa L. Okay. Okay. We have a case, a 59-year-old female. Sorry, I got to cut him off for just a second here. Corrado, are you okay? Corrado, wake up. All right. So, by the way, you notice how good the dispatcher is asking questions on both of these? Dispatcher's good. What did Solid. she say? What's going on? Tell me exactly what happened. What If you asked a patient that question, how much could you tell by the way the patient answered you in terms of their LOC, their speech patterns, their mentation, everything? Quite a bit, right? Uh, now, distress just, level, everything. Right. And now just listen to this patient. What's her airway status? Not sounding. Yeah. A little muffled. It sounds, yeah. Okay, muffling aside, how's her speech? Is she pretty good? Is she, yeah. she has a swollen tongue, but she's able to speak properly. Okay, does she have a swollen tongue? She stated that her tongue was swollen. I thought I heard something. I believe. But... So, I, I heard her spirit, tongue was swollen. Without so much as getting in the room with her, whatever her stated complaint is, do you get how much assessing you can do before you even see the patient? Yes, say sir. You, say you were at an apartment and you were second on scene and you're just kind of waiting outside the door and listening to whoever's inside assessing them. You can get a lot of information just by listening to her talk. So right now I can tell you reliably that at this moment, she's not in respiratory distress. At this moment, her volume is good because her ability to project and make a long sentence, which means exhalation, is intact. It's normal. At this moment, I can hear that between words, she's taking a normal breath. It's not like she's going, my tongue is swollen, I can't breathe. <gasps> and my lips are this and that and this and that and this and that. <laughs> she's speaking normally. I didn't say that in 10 minutes, her respirations are going to be okay. I could say right now they're okay. So assessing is a lot more than just looking at their mouth and chucking their airway. First thing you hear, first thing you get is when you listen to them, listen to their patterns, 
and so on. And obviously if she's talking like this and she's breathing like this and at a normal rate, what can you infer about her ABCs as a whole? She's got a heart. They're, they're good. They're still stable, well, normal-ish. At least they're okay right now, right? What is the joke about an MCI when everyone's screaming? Everyone's alive. Everyone's, okay. everyone's alive, right? So in this case, you can say that at this point, her vital signs are compatible with life. Her mentation is good and regimented, and she keeps telling you the same thing, which means that she's got enough perfusion to her brain, and that her airway is patent, and her breathing pattern at this point is okay. You could do a lot by just, that's where you go back to the assessment sheet. And when I say go there and get, stand back for a second and get a general impression. If you stand back for a second, you can get a massively good general impression of this girl before you even lay eyes on her. So going back down to Dave Page, by the way, this guy's apparently amazing dude and a, a, a workaholic fiend. I'm surprised he's not dead yet. She appears to be having an allergic reaction. The crew is acting absolutely normally. They're doing exactly what they should be. They've identified that she's been exposed to a known allergen. Let's listen in. Why'd you wait so why'd you wait an hour to call? Notice how Mark has identified this is a life-threatening condition. He is a little bit annoyed that she waited this long to call 911. Patients wait way, way longer. In this case, we're happy that she actually called within the hour of her symptoms start. What's her problem? What's her condition, by the way? Anyone know yet? Uh angioedema. Yeah. Did you watch this before? No. So what's angioedema? Uh, localized swelling to the tongue or face. The, the lips. lips. Big fat lips. It can go to the throat. It can't be bad, but it's a totally different thing. So good catch, Chevy. Again, this is uh, just, you could see a lot just by well, looking. Okay. So even though Mark's a little bit perturbed, actually the patient did the right thing and she called pretty early in this process. So we're gonna give you two medications, okay? One is epinephrine, which is gonna help deal with the reaction. The other is Benadryl, which is also gonna help deal with the reaction, okay? You've never had an allergy to shellfish before? No. No? Okay. Don't poke your arm here, okay? Just relax your arm. Notice how skilled Mark is. He's drawn up the epinephrine very, very quickly, and he's gonna give the shot right away. Now, giving adrenaline for an allergic reaction is the exact right thing to do for this particular patient, and doing it quickly really, really matters. If you're an EMT, you have an auto-injector EpiPen, uh, either that belongs to the patient. In some states, some EMTs can give it without uh, medical control. Some need to call for medical control. But in both cases, whether you carry it or the patient carries it, giving the IM injection is very, it's very good and very quick. Now, there's been some recent studies about giving epinephrine IM versus sub-Q. In this case, Mark chose to go the sub-Q route, which is per protocol. I want to go back just a second, guys, so you could see what her appearance was like. And what are her vital signs right there? They're reported. Fairly stable. You, you saw her vital signs. And someone told them when they got on scene, it sounds like first in, uh, that they had 100 over 60, pulse rate of 110, SPO2 of 98. And they said she was wheezing, right? You guys see that part, right? So this happens, especially if you run, who works in Hemet? If I went to Calamesa Fire, where they have EMTs in the engine, this is the sort of story I might get. Now, looking at her, Look at her now and assess her breathing, mentation, circulation for yourself. Pay attention to her physical stuff. Wow, 
Why'd you wait so? Why'd you wait an hour to call? Notice how Mark has identified this is a life-threatening condition. He is a little bit annoyed that she waited this long to call 911. Patients wait. All right, guys, what's her respiratory rate, depth, and effort? I'm trying to cut it. I uh, can't really see the effort. Exactly. But it doesn't look labored. Did you see any uh, effort on her to speak of? No. No, I think really. the effort is probably not there. You yeah. guys remember what the tracheal tugging looks like? Remember what the girl in the video with the epi looked like? How yeah, no. is she breathing? Looks looks normal. I don't see any What's anything. I don't think she's in that much distress. She looks fairly anxious, but not really. She's anxious, but that's about. But yeah, so this is really important because I disagree in the video, and I know the narrator, whoever they got the contract, is probably a company he works at. If he bashes on the medic, it's not going to probably get another chance to film anything. But this medic really freaking jumped way way over on this call um and, and probably the best thing he did was give her the epi sub q because it has a much more blunted effect when you do that way slower so what i want you to look at he heard allergic reaction on the dispatch he hears that she feels like she's having an allergic reaction what sort of assessment did he do of her uh, i didn't really I didn't really see an assessment. Yeah. He just based it off of her swollen yes. tongue. And... I think he just based it off the swollen mouth. Yeah, and you could be caught by that because if you've never seen angioedema, which is a common reaction to blood pressure medication, especially ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors. Um, it's considered a benign reaction. You definitely want to keep your eye on it. And it might be really important to know what would, let me back up a second. Say we go to Chevy. Chevy, you see this chick there, you think, oh crap, this looks like an angioedema. What do you want to kind of ask her to figure out how critical this call is going to be or may be? Uh, how critical? I mean, she doesn't really look like a critical patient, but I would definitely try to figure out her past medical history and because uh, it, it just doesn't present as an allergic reaction to me. Okay, so fair enough. Let me ask you this. Uh, who haven't I picked on yet? Uh, Tyson T, do you want me to ask you this or not? Glad you asked. So, if someone took a poison or overdosed, okay, or you got called out because a kid ingested mom's freaking medicines, what do you kind of want to know that gives you, like, so what's some imp imp important information to know? Unknown medicine, you don't know what it is. What he what he took first of all? Dave, don't know. Well, how long? How long what? How long he was taking it for, or what? How long ago? How long ago? Okay. And why is that important? Because of the onset. So I mean, if he took it five hours ago, if nothing's happened, then. Well, that's not a bad reason, right? So coming back to Chevy, if she got a big fat lips right now. And there's a hypothetical risk that it progresses to airway obstruction at some point. He called dispatch, we'll assume, 10, 15 minutes ago. What might you want to ask her as far as how, what, uh, uh, OP, QRST kind of thing? Um, as far as like onset, she noticed it. He said about an hour so far she's been having an issue. So uh, as far as that, if she's taking meds, when she took her meds, if she took her meds before she ate, because she tried to blame it on food because she wasn't sure. So how far, like how far before, or how long before she took her meds, or before she ate, when she took her meds. Okay, and, I'm gonna uh, push. okay. I'm gonna step over to Robert Aguilera. He's staring at his llama. No, I'm, I'm like trying to think. Um, I'm also thinking maybe like, like, does anything make it better for her? Is she able to, like, breathe fine? Okay. Uh, okay. 
maybe like a certain position makes her feel better. Um, Ooh, quality. Christopher Bowie, I've kind of harped on you guys saying this over and over again. Their vital signs are stable, but how do you know? What might you want to ask her to find out if this is getting worse, better, or staying the same? If she's experiencing any shortness of breath or anything, if she's in pain. Marker? Um, well, I mean, I would just think like you said, majority of the time it can be from blood pressure meds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe like see if she took some BP meds or something, and then maybe that had well, an on. Nothing, nothing to do with progression. With progress. Uh, ask her when she last felt normal. That might be a good thing. That's a good in the right direction. TJ Smith. Yeah. Yeah. What would you want to ask her? Find out um, if it's stable or not. Oh, as this. Uh, what other questions can I ask? I want to get more vital signs to be. <laughs> So you want to get more vital signs. That's not a bad idea to confirm the original thing. So I'm going to stop it here. I'm going to ask you this. If I was talking to her and she had a big fat lip, one, I'd double check those vital signs. She looks good enough to me that I can sit there and say, I want to see another look at these vital signs. She is not the chick in the kitchen who's so bad. I don't really need any more vital signs. Her vital signs are on her presentation. I'm not going to waste time, cap, no pulse ox, no the other crap with that one chick. I'm going to go straight to treatment. This girl, different picture. But I might say, so your lips, they feel swollen right now. When you call dispatch, you know, if you had to give a score, like how bad your swelling was on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being completely shutting off your mouth and one being normal, how was it when you talked to dispatch? just to get a number. I don't even care what the number is. She was five. Are you better, the worse, or the same? Is your lip swelling getting worse? Or is it staying the same or getting better? Because if she says, when I called dispatch, it was a five, because I can't hear the dispatch transcript right. And now she says that the seven is getting worse Then I know that in the span of a few minutes, this thing is ramping up. And there's no medication I have in my drug box that will fix an angioedema patient. Nothing. What if it's just caused from an allergic reaction? Like, because that's what I was expecting or suspecting for her. Exactly, but this, it isn't. I might try the epi because I got no other choice. I'd probably do the Benadryl first. It's much more likely to prog prevent progression. Because remember, why do you give epi? Bronchodilation, vasoconstriction systemically, it's going to have no effect on the lips. Yeah. Okay, so you have to know mechanism of action. If I was really going to try, give her a shot of epi right in her damn lip and shrink it down, but that's not what's going to cause her to choke. It's going to be the throat that swells up. So going back to kind of like, because when we talked about timelines of calls, if when she called dispatch, she was sounding like this and say, you know, have you ever walked into the house and they got the dispatcher on the phone with the patient, all that crap there? You ever had that happen? If she's bad, I called dispatch right back. Hey, dispatcher, did she sound like she got worse when we were talking to her? Did her voice start to change? Oh, yeah. We're out of here. We're on the unit and get the fuck out. I need to get her to someplace that can RSI or do what they need to do. Because... Remember that whole stable versus within normal limits? I need to see if she's going downhill or not. So this is what I'm looking at with the assessment of the OPQRST stability and going back to Ty's uh, overdose or ingestion. When I get a call for a kid that ate some stuff, how was he? He was fine 10 minutes ago. Now he's all barely able to keep his head up. Well, shit. Guess what that kid's doing? That number.
So asking your history and physical is a little bit like asking, you know, when you're standing out on the street and you hear a car coming at you, how fast is it approaching? Do I need to get out of the street now or do I have a long time to stand around? And the only way you can do that is by checking for progression. Does that make sense, Chevy? Yes, sir. So I, I hope in retrospect it makes sense. Maybe you thought about it and just didn't put it into words. But you kind of have to make a decision on this call. And uh, as far as jumping over the hoops and treating her like they did, Murrieta Hospital Loma Linda did even worse. The girl there didn't even have fat lips. She was just sitting there looking at him and someone said allergic reaction. They basically shit on themselves on their way to get down there. Killed two other patients while they're pushing the crash cart ahead of them and gets in there and she's like this here. Let's <laughs> take a moment to assess her. So let's go on, on the, uh, what, what I wanted to get here and not to spend more time, the important part of this call was as a medic, as an EMT, is this serious or not? Is she dying in front of me or not? And looking at her here, I think everyone agrees she's not dropping dead in your lap. But how can you predict where she's going to be? By looking where she was, like a history lesson. Keep it kind of easy. Everything else is generic right of the mill crap. So, and eventually admit that it was a, um, the uh, angioedema. So I'm gonna close her out of there and go back to unscreen sharing. And I apologize, I forget, I, I could see your faces, but you couldn't see mine when I'm asking the question. So um, any comments or questions on that call? As far as Epi goes, uh, I understand exactly what it's targeting, one to 1,000. Um, but you're saying it does little or like pretty much nothing to any kind of facial uh, edema? You should probably look up angioedema after we hang up. Specifically angioedema? Yeah. Uh, there's a, a wide range of effects, but if I was going to go Epi because she's swelling up in her mouth, we already talked about this actually. And this is not scope of practice, okay? So this is something that it's not in our scope of practice. But say she was swelling up in her mouth around the tonsils. Say it was an abscess in the back of her throat, Ludwig's angina, and it started to affect her airway. What do you have in your toolbox that you might be able to fix that with or stall? Aerosolized epinephrine. Aerosolized epinephrine. just like with croup or epiglottitis. You are now basically putting the epi directly on the tissues you want to cause vasoconstriction of. If the swelling is happening because of vasodilation and capillary leakage and interstitial edema, what can we do to reverse that? Vasoconstriction, reduce the tissue with swelling. So, Mr. Richie, when you do aerosolized epi, uh, is, are you doing, like, what concentration are you doing? Well, I'm going to dilute it because I need it to last a while. If I just put one cc, it's going to last me five minutes, ten minutes max of the neb. So, I'll take, a, I'll take that milligram and one to 1,000, throw it into a bron uh, basically the regular saline, three cc's of saline, and neb it. Or, because it doesn't hurt anything, throw it into albutal, just preset, two and a half cc's, mix a whole lot, and mix it and dilute it and go. So at that point, sir, would you still do the 0.3 of the 1 to 1,000? No, because her BP is fine or freaking, she's not showing any signs of shock. And she's not showing any signs of bronchospasm. She's not showing any signs of late, nothing that is affiliated with the anaphylactic shock or even a severe allergic reaction. And that's why going back to that scene, I needed you to look at because when he's talking, you're listening to him saying he's doing the exact right thing. He's getting great technique and all that other shit. Well, you can have great technique on the wrong patient. Okay, if I shoot someone and hit him right between the eyes at 500 yards with a pistol, I have a great shot unless I hit the wrong person. Yeah, I want to get the right treatment of the right patient. So in that case there, I, you know, I wanted to the, a voice out to you actually assess her. 
So if you are nervous about your ability to assess patients, and we all know simulated assessments are difficult, especially if you haven't seen a lot and you can kind of create your own patient, I would strongly encourage you to watch these videos and maybe just to test yourself like we did here, turn off the volume. See what you see before you even listen to anything and see what you can pick up on your own. Because when you're on scene on a real call, no one's going to be telling you all this information. Hey, look at this. Check this out. Look at that. Blah, blah, blah. They're going to be looking at you and saying, what do you want to do? Use those videos. They're, they're, they're really rare. I'm, glad, I'm amazed they even have those. So um, let me stop on that. Um, remember, guys, this is it's an assessment class. But assessment isn't about just asking the questions. I hope you guys are getting that. Assessments is much about knowing which questions to ask and when, and then well, how do you know which question to ask? By having an idea what's wrong and how badly it's wrong and how fast it's getting wrong or better. And then recognizing what your findings are and then knowing what to do about them. Like with the epi on this guy here, he, he autopiloted straight into allergic reaction. That's like one thing I've noticed too with some medics that I've worked uh, with before. They just strictly go off of what we get on our, mo our monitors instead of actually seeing what the call presents. Yes. Uh, there was a case. They actually wrote it up for an a, a intensive care uh, unit. They had a 55-year-old man, and he was in the hospital with like he had atrial fibrillation at like 110 or something and uh normal bp um and he was it was some bullshit call it wasn't even like anything serious i forget what it was like a procedure then at the nurse's station they saw that his heart rate had jumped up to 228 and that he was in bad shape so they all called a crash go into him they uh basically the doctor kind of runs in with the little code blue team and the patient's like what's wrong and like, oh, we need to fix you. His pulse ox is reading 70. His heart rate on the pulse ox is reading 220 something. Uh, they started to break out the defib pads. And the patient's like not complaining of a thing, except now he's scared. As if you would be if everyone suddenly gang rushed your freaking hospital bed. How long do you think it took for someone to look at the monitor and actually check his pulse rate? before they found out it was just the pulse ox probing because he had a little shaking in his hands. It was given a complete bullshit thing. Probably this a while. Isn't, this isn't, I graduated from EMT school two months ago and I'm working on a freaking volunteer squad. This is a goddamn hospital where everyone's got two to four years of formal training minimum and they're all missing this. So look at the patient. And then check your equipment and make sure what you're capturing is legitimate. So uh, that, that's, uh, it happens. It really happens. And it's almost embarrassing to watch happen. So um, let's take a, a, a quick break. Uh, come back in 1615, 1620. Uh, Mr. Ritchie. Yeah. Um, I saw that the time for this class ends at 640, but um, I work at 7. Oh, so. that's just the Zoom setting. The class doesn't thing. change. Yeah, because the Zoom, okay. it, um, I just let it stretch because I don't want it to shut down the Zoom Okay. by accident. Sounds good. Thanks. Just wanted uh, to let you know just in case I had to leave early or not. Nope, but. Of course. If you ever need to leave early for a legit reason, let me know anyways. But yeah, I just make the time artificially last longer in case something gets in the way, so. Copy, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna leave early today. I need to catch up on my sleep. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, apparently I'm saving lives you're today. Getting, catching up on your sleep right now, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I've been listening. I actually was thinking about that one though. Which one, who's got the guilty conscience? That you me? Hey, I was here. Uh, Robert, oh, you listen. I I watch you. You pay attention, uh, and and, uh, and that's good because I could tell, because I can always see a little smoke coming out of your ears. 
<laughs> I'm always trying to think and figure things out, but and I'm working. I, I tell you what, uh, kiddo, the more you think, the better you get at it. Learning is some, yeah. the learn skill. So people who say they can't learn, they don't know how to study. Who the hell teaches you how to study? You know, you learn how to study yeah. by studying. And then you do what everyone else does. Well, that didn't work. Let me try this way. Yeah. I learned how to study by competing with my friends because I was tired of being the dumbass of the group of four. Yeah, baby. Uh, that was it. But it was competition that got me to get better. Otherwise, I didn't think I could do it. It was pure ego. But it's just like anything else. If you don't try, you're not going to figure out your own buttons. You're not going to figure out how stuff registers in you. So everything I'm kind of telling you is like, um, like TJ likes to practice by basically sniping on other crews. All oh, these fuckers are idiots. You know, I would do this and that. I'm like, good. You might, he's sometimes wrong what he's saying, but if he's actually engaged, he's getting interested, then that's good. Because you're interested. It's when you're kind of sitting back there like this. <laughs> Gorilla, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't Buddy. bother me, except it's a waste of your time. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you're spending so much time. You're getting up early. You're freaking spending money. You're losing shifts. Some of you guys are busting your asses. Um, you know, Derek. That man is working full time and doing this. It's insane. I don't know and guess how what? You do it, I, I cry every night. Expect that. It goes to show you. Um, uh, I've talked with a few of you about this, but there's a difference between I want to be a medic and I am going to be a medic. Oh, I'm going to be a medic. There's a do or die thing where I don't care how slow you start, you're going to gain traction. And even if it takes you two years, it's like freaking A. I admire that. No one makes movies about guys who get everything, a Heisman Trophy easy. They walked on the football field one day and that season they got a Heisman Trophy because they're just good. What are all the movies about? What inspires people? It's a guy who freaking isn't supposed to make it. They're too dumb, too slow, they're handicapped, whatever they can't get there. That's the shit that inspires you. So I admire the dummies and the slow pokes who really try as opposed to the guy who's just kind of like, eh, let me try this. I mean, whatever. It's, it, it's, you know, all of you can do this, but not all of you will. Oh, shit. And that's that your it, it isn't a bad thing. If you don't want to be a medic, that's fine. No, I'm never doing a physician, it. and I freaking don't plan to be a physician. So I don't want to. And I certainly don't want to bad enough. You should do what you want to do. And if you're good at it, then it becomes a perfect marriage. If you're just doing this for a paycheck or to get on fire, I hope you fail. Oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> See you, Rob. I don't mind getting fire and I don't mind the job. What I do mind is a trail of broken bodies and dead people that you leave in your wake because of being, it's like getting the lazy mechanic checking the plane you're going to be on. No, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm. I, I consider myself a good person. I don't think I'll be like a mean one. Only you could say that. I'm inclined to believe you. But one of uh, several, one of my family friends, three of them are pilots. And someone was joking. They said, uh, you know, in fact, Heather. Her name is Heather Robinson. Fucking smart, like 12 degrees and everything. I always feel like the black sheep of the family when I go there because everyone there is like awesome. And. Um, you know, you know, I don't like cousin Elmer coming out there with my RV <clears throat> Christmas vacation style. And she said, do you think it's bad that I'm a perfectionist as a pilot? I'm like what? So I'm what a perfectionist pilot. The last thing I want is some lot of shit who's just hoping everything works when they take off. You want a perfectionist as a medic. You want a perfectionist as a physician. Because a perfectionist is so their own worst critic, and they're the ones who grow fastest. They may be insufferable assholes, but they tend to be hardest on themselves. And the people they are rude to is people in their profession that make them look like shit. And they basically give the profession a bad name because they're not, they don't care what they're doing. Yeah. So remember, you're affecting lives at this job. <clears throat> Let me come down here. Got it. 
So I think Dixon the, was uh, asking me, Dixon, how old are you again? Like uh, 21, sir. 18. <laughs> so only in the interest of public shaming and humiliation, <clears throat> one of the letters he said is, how are you going to check our cards online? <laughs> now remember, I'm an old fogey. Some people confuse me with Mr. Duncan. Can't even turn on a computer. <laughs> on. Garcia. Uh, and I didn't know how I was going to possibly answer this question. So this I asked one. Eric, how do you think I would ask for your cards? <laughs> so one I'm, not, one. I'm not going to grade your cards. I've got more than enough work. But a bunch of people have said, how can I study better? I am failing. I am not learning this. Okay. A real issue is, is basically when you're doing your assessment and trying to figure out at what point you've got enough information to make a, an educated guess on what to do, whether it's a diagnosis or just a course of action. Because there's cases where you don't know what's wrong with the patient, but you still have actions you can take. You can correct a sign of shock, even if you're not sure why they're in shock. And with pharmacology, you guys write cards. And what is the reason for that? You kind of yeah, easily reference problem. stuff, right? It's the same thing. Because if you think about it, for like Jared, uh, Jarek, people who work in the field, um, a lot of the calls you learn, you learn because you ran into it. And it sticks. And you kind of remember the findings that stuck out. Uh, uh, when, um, Campbell, I remember CHS because Lasix, Lasix, Lasix on that one. Yeah, which is dumb because Lasix doesn't really do that for CHF. It's like, <clears throat> but... Never forget I, a dentist. Role for Donna Free yeah. Hospital. I've given hundreds of milligrams of Lasix, and uh, and uh, once again, Lasix itself isn't that necessarily a bad agent, <clears throat> but medics were giving it like this medic gave epinephrine for an angioedema. They're giving Lasix for someone with pneumonia or a euvolemic CHF or that's chronic and just killing them. So it's one. A lot of times you can't blame the medication; it's how it's used. So Barker. Your case of syncopal episode, what were the things that stuck out in your brain that you learned that call, thanks to Campbell? Um, well, I mean, I, I understood more what you meant about the whole proximal distal, like the difference between his temp on his arms versus his thoracic area. And then like how quick he got diaphoretic was insane. <laughs> um, You're a hero, Campbell. You, I don't know what you're yeah. thinking about, but diaphoresis is on the top of your charts now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it, I think it was like, like, obviously, like, it kind of sucked for him, but I think it was pretty good for everyone that was in there to kind of see it in person and just see how yeah. quick that stuff can happen, too. Like, sucks for him. <laughs> we had to do all the work. He didn't even know what happened. He just went to sleep. <laughs> He's like, I mean, the teasing the car that goes to sleep and you got to drive six hours. Oh, Dad, are you done yet? But, okay, so I take your point, Bar uh, Zabala. Sir. What about you? I, you were in that emergency. Uh, aside from what she said, I mean, number one, how big day, how big day to wait really is. And number two is... Um, what did you say about even afterward, it really is? I, I didn't understand. I... Because, I mean, how do I explain this? It means dead weight. <laughs> so this is a good point. Had you ever picked up someone who's like actually unconscious? Uh, no. Anyone who's like, you, if, especially you guys firefighter drills, and I know the military, they say pick someone up off the ground. But if you ever had to pick someone who's actually freaking unconscious, good luck. Unless you have like the best technique on earth. It's amazing. How much do you weigh, Kevin? 180, sir. You weighed about 500 pounds. Lightweight. Like physics, as soon as you get unconscious, your normal muscle tone is gone. 
now you just automatically double in weight. And that's kind of interesting. And that's a good experience you had because uh, I think going back, I'm just thinking about it. When I had my first Heimlich maneuver on a standing patient and they went unresponsive, they were as small as Barker is. And Barker weighed 400 pounds right then. I was like, I can't believe this. I deadlift 400 pounds for workouts and I'm finding myself getting dragged to the ground with her because I was out of position. Dead weight is freaking heavyweight. So that rhymes. So as far as Barker, did you guys, did you get the skin signs, the relevance, the diaphoresis, the color? It all came together, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who else? Jarek was there filming, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was all, all of it, I guess. Sorry. Well, I need the other film for the other uh, IV thing. I can't do anything unless I get all the IV films to put those pictures together. So Moore sent me his. I need whoever else did those videos so I can stretch them out. Oh, and, I'll email you mine. Thank you. So I guess why I'm saying this is because that call in your head, I'm assuming, just became a mini Rolodex card. You will not forget the first person you saw go syncopal, diaphoretic, pale, and crump in front of you. At least not for a long time. And as you see it again, you're going to recognize it for what it is a lot faster. And if I asked you to write down a card on what someone looks like when they're syncopal, what I'd want you to write are the things that made that obvious. Did his loss of consciousness alert you first? No, because he didn't look like he lost consciousness, did it? Did he know he lost consciousness? No. Okay. These are all critical things. But you did see he started to act a little weird. Remember, he kind of his posture changed and he started to have that palsy. Then he got pale. Then he got diaphoretic. And basically, he was out on his feet. I'm, I'm just mad because I didn't have a monitor on him because I would have loved to have, like, we still got to talk about that, Kevin. I can pay you to freaking do this again. Okay, if you have a cardiac monitor and run it through. Um, because there's no one out there. We can't do skin science for practice. You can't see this stuff. And so it was, a, it was an amazing experience. So coming back to the cards that I asked you to write, it's for that same reason. What makes an HHS different than a DKA? What makes a Guillain-Barre or a dystonia treatment recognizable and treatable. If you've never bothered to look at it and you just read the book, you're not gonna remember that crap, just like with your farm. So when you work as an EMT and as a paramedic, you start to build a Rolodex of patients that you remember. That takes a long time to do. You can get ahead of that process starting now. So starting with this uh, dystonic reaction, classic dystonic reaction, Jonathan Corrado, uh, uh, tell me everything you know about that. Uh, dystonic reaction? Yep. I know that we treat it with Benadryl. Okay, what is it? How does it present? It presents basically they're be lethargic. Um, their head shifts to one side of the body, usually. Um, and they can talk. They're not confused, but they get like a slurred speech, basically. I don't know what causes it, though. Okay. Did you read it? No. I did not read it, sir. Okay. So there's the other part about this class. If you don't do anything, um, uh, Carrillo, can you tell me about that whole horses and water saying that we've all been told about for our, like our entire lives? Uh, you can lead a horse to water, can't make him drink. Yes. Okay. So that's another key fact of life. This is school and learning. If you don't try, you're not going to get anything. All right. So uh, Guillain Barre, anyone recognize that one? Wait, what was that? Guillain Barre. It's part of the reading list I sent to you, and I even put down the page numbers. 
I'll say it in in, in, in English. Oh, PBS. Gillian uh, Barrow. I actually <laughs> transported a patient, a younger. Um, actually, when I did a CCT, I actually had a younger patient. He was a male, probably in his mid twenties, who had Guillain-Barré syndrome. And uh, it was like kind of like almost a sudden onset, but he was actually like a CrossFit trainer and super healthy dude. And then all of a sudden, like couldn't walk or anything and couldn't talk or anything. How did that see? This is actually another uh, uh, chef. You got some good cases. So what is the problem with Guillain Barre? You run this guy at home. What is the concern? What happens to these guys? Uh, they kind of lose control of every aspect of their body as far as like breathing and and everything on their own. So, I mean, it could yeah. go downhill pretty quick. Okay. Because they're, I mean, you're, basically your immune system attacks itself. Uh, yep. Anyone else want to add into that? You usually feel like tingling sensations on your extremities. And yeah, you do feel like pretty weak. And sometimes you could be placed on a ventilator. Why do they put you on a ventilator? Because uh, it, it, uh, it affects like your muscles, like the diaphragm. You can't control muscles. your diaphragm or anything so like that. Like, uh, there's weakness, there's weakness that, that like develops. Um, it's the nervous system is being attacked. And then there's like weakness to the diaphragm basically. And right. so there's two weeks free. So if I was going to write a card on Game Barre syndrome, and I pray to God I never get it, um, and I've learned about this first on IFTs, and then I've had my friends in the hospital, UCI and UCSD, they'll say, man, we got this dude came in. He started out weakness in his lower legs, then he was unable to walk, now he's having trouble breathing, we're getting ready to RSI, and we're going to send him straight to a trach and run him off to a fucking con home. Autoimmune attack, no one knows what causes it, but the presentation is typically, tingling is the earliest sign, but it's very nonspecific. Once again, to that timeline, especially if it's someone who's not like your, your aerobics instructor, or I'm sorry, your CrossFit dude, what happened? Well, I'm starting to get weak or I'm tripping. You know, it's yeah, not funny. He initially went to the hospital for like uh, tingling and his in his tongue and like he wasn't really able to talk and and couldn't stand up on his own and they couldn't figure it out they thought he was having a stroke and they ruled all of that out and then after like a day or two in the hospital he ended up like basically coding almost and so they had to trach him and put him on a vent and then that's when the doctor figured out what was going on because then he eventually lost like everything like he couldn't talk he couldn't move his arms he couldn't move his head like he was basically a full body like quad so shitty story how old was this guy probably mid-20s but then it was really cool too so we ended up transporting him from tbh to somewhere in san diego and then uh my nurse ended up uh his family was super nice they actually ended up getting in touch with her and probably like nine months after the whole thing he was actually started walking well attempting to walk again okay so on your card if i was going to write this unexplained onset of weakness typically starting in the feet or the legs the lower extremities and what they the, the dry terminology is creeping or ascending paralysis all right that means the paralysis moves up and by the time it gets to your stomach any er that they start picking that up they're starting going to tell you listen you're not we're going to have to put you to sleep and put you on a ventilator. And after several days on a trach, on a, on a intubation, uh, and especially with Guillain-Barre, they know what's gonna happen. They're just gonna put you on a trach because if they leave the tube in, your chance of getting infected in pneumonia is really bad. Your vocal cords are ruined forever, et cetera. Now you're paralyzed because you're conscious. Imagine now you're paralyzed and you're in the hospital and you're all disgusting and gross because in the US they don't bathe you well half the time and you can't wipe your own ass, you can't face, someone shows the Foley's in you, and you can't talk. And they move you around like a bag, call freaking PMS ambulance, two guys who freaking hate life, throw you on a freaking bed, run you down to whatever con home your insurance can manage, 
And now you're there for another nine months paralyzed. Imagine. It's awful. You can't even blink. And everyone who's treating you has never looked up Guillain Barre. They don't know what it is, aside from the nursing staff, because this is fairly common. No one talks to you. You're just a piece of luggage. It's Can like you think paralyzed. Through? Huh? Does your does he have mental capacity to think yeah. what's happening around you? You are completely with it. Yeah, his uh, he I actually wanted, came yeah, up with his own system. He came up with his own system. He uh, the, him and his family came up with their own system. Like it was basically like playing charades or something, and they had a a board with all the letters on it, and then he would, you know, like they would say, okay, the first word, and then he. would he would go along the alphabet and then stop at a letter and then he would just create words like that, but he couldn't talk and like couldn't move his eyes or anything. It was like, I don't know, it was weird. What a story. So, um, are you working after this? Today, sir? Yeah. Uh, not today, sir, no. Okay. I actually want to get a couple of your calls because uh, I'm really, it's a good teaching call. So, this isn't a glamorous call, guys, but I'm talking about when we're talking about health care, whose health are we talking about? People. Is mental health part of that picture? You betcha it is. And if you don't believe it, wait till you're the guy who's paralyzed and people are treating like you're no one. I've read a lot of accounts, the worst in the VA, by guys who come out there fucked up and they're treated like garbage. Um, I, until you've been on that side, you will not completely understand it. But you will now understand what it means to be a care provider. And the guy I ran on, I think about Wretched Canyon. He was some Mexican dude, a field worker, busted ass all his life, first generation. He gets Guillain Barre down for like 11 months a year. Then they have to go through rehab because if they're not doing the constant care, they become spastic and palsied. So if family doesn't help them and the staff doesn't help them, DQ ulcers, sepsis, the works, the whole nightmare. And they're conscious and they feel everything. He gets out of it and he gets it again the following year. Normally it's a one and done, unless you're this poor bastard. My heart broke for him. What can I do? Physically nothing much, but you know what you can't do to a patient like that? If you know it's Gabe Barre, you could talk to him. Mr. Ritchie? Yeah. So, with Guillain Barr, is there ways that they can fix it? Because there's a an R and B singer by the name of August Alcina, um, and he actually got diagnosed with Guillain Barr. He actually went on his social media and all that stuff a couple, like a year ago, saying, "I woke up, couldn't feel my legs, and I, I couldn't walk." So then he was admitted to the hospital, and it took like a year. But now he's walking, back in music and everything. So it's like, is there, I guess, a cure for it or? No, it's self they, they could try steroids, basically the same stuff like with the ear, autoimmune uh -huh. disorders. There's a lot of stuff they try, but it's fairly conservative because no one knows for sure. I think herpes virus, uh, uh, herpes simplex virus, I believe, Epstein-Barr virus, they're like these basically latent infections. They're the ones that are blamed a lot for it, but no one knows for sure. Yeah, I know they do like immune suppressants and they try like steroids and stuff, but yeah. it's all based off your body and how, like basically how your immune system attacks yeah. the nerve cells. And it's tricky because if you give immune suppressants, you wind up weakening your immunity. So it's how do you do targeted yeah. suppression? And if you have a person who has an indwelling Foley's forever, you already got to deal with issues like UTIs. Uh, whoever the RT is, it's suctioning your trach all the time all these other things, it's, it's just a nightmare. And I've always just thought, what would it be like to be trapped in your body, conscious and hearing, and have nothing but time to think? Would you go nuts? I mean, well, I don't even know. I just don't, and I hope to God it never happens. So again, this is not something you could necessarily treat, but everyone in EMS needs to know this condition and that's why it's in your, in your, in your text. Um, your cards differentiating DKA and HHS. Um, uh, Jared Gott, if you had to differentiate the two, and it was on your test, uh, what would be uh, how you differentiate these two? 
differenti- different, uh, differentiate between dystonic uh, reaction and the gallium? No. This differentiate between uh, DKA and HHS. Oh, wow. Um, you say you don't know. No, I do know. I, okay, so DKA is generally due to type 1 diabetics. You can get that through their past history. Type 2 is generally with HHS. Um, you can differentiate between... Um, so DKA is uh, ketones, so you could base it off their... Uh, smell their breath if it's smelling sweet. HHS, you're not going to have that. Um, also, uh, with HHS, uh, when you get your blood glucose, it's going to read really high. Probably past that you can, what the gauge actually reads. While DKA, you, you'll get a high number, but it's not going to be in that uh, extreme levels. So, start. So, I would like to correct something. I, I heard, Mr. Uh, you were told that ketones only builds up in DKA. That's incorrect. It's only partially true. You develop ketosis in either condition. Correct. Keto. But in, in, in HHS, it, correct me if I'm wrong. HHS, you still do, well, second type 2 diabetes, which is related to HHS. Um, you still have uh, insulin. It's just, it doesn't, uh, it's not used properly. That's why your ketones doesn't really no. uh, affect you. If you go on a fast, if all of you guys right now decided to do a five day fast, probably really good for you. Guess what your breath would smell like after you brush your teeth on the fifth day? Mm-hmm. Ketones. You'd have acetone breath. You'd have a funny, sweet smelling breath because you're in ketosis. And your ketones, hi, sweetheart, normally level out at about eight. I believe it's uh, millimoles. Okay, ketoacidosis is when you have something like three to five times what you would get in a normal fasting diet. And now you become acidotic. So if you remember your test question where it said, which one is which, one of those had a pH of below 7.35. Guess So you're not acidotic, you're alkalotic. You're not acidotic, okay? But that's all fine and dandy because I always leave my little pH meter and VBG calculator at home. I'm actually on the market looking for them. They're freaking expensive, okay? So none of us can check a pH in the field, a serum pH, because that's your first delineator. If they're acidemic, that's the first requirement to be in DKA. So far, so good? If you forget that, remember what DKA stands for. Diabetic keto acid dosis. And technically it should be acidemia at that point. pH is dropped below 7.35. So, so far, nothing wrong with what you've said, but don't forget the acetone breath can be on both. But now the next question, both of them have high blood sugar, but you said at our blood glucose meters, they peg out at somewhere around four or 500, right? So that's not going to really help us. Although you want to keep in mind, you could be a DKA even with a glucose of 300, which is within reading. So what's a vital sign that would make the biggest obvious difference? What was the respiratory rate of your HHS patient? Real call, by the way. You did it twice, you should know. Who was the assessor? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Um, I'll ask you it was fast? Was it very deep? Was it Kuzmals? It was pretty normal. It was normal. If anything, it'll be slightly increased because of dehydration and the hyperosmolar state of the blood. Because HHS kills you from dehydration basically hypovolemic shock. Okay, that kid wasn't near shock, but he's a really healthy kid, 14 years old, Japanese dude. But in DKA, they're acidemic. What is their respiratory system trying to do to correct pH? Blow off. Kuzma, right? it's trying to compensate and blow off. Deep breathing. You remember the video of the kid's breathing that I showed you on the, on the uh, canvas? 
If you don't remember, all those videos are still there. You just got to go look. That's going to be how you tell the field. So even though if you gave a, a patient and you put the electrolytes and you put their blood gases on a screen and all the other shit and say, what's this? I'm like, oh yeah, first yeah, I'm going to zero on a pH. They're normal or not. And then I can basically start cutting it down. Which one of us has those tools on a field call? None. So on your card, this is what you want to put in there. You could put on what the general etiology is. You could put on they're both super hyperglycemic, but remember DHA can be down into the 300s. But what differentiates it to is one is acidemic and the respiratory rate depth, not effort, rate and depth is going to be reflecting that. They will be typically hyperventilating or look like they're hyperventilating, but their CO2 level is going to be what? Because they're in acidemia now, decompensated basically. Low. Oh. Rapid deep respirations, but their CO2 is going to be low. Kind of making sense. Treatment for both, the nice thing is, same. Support of ABCs, but gen generically speaking, fluids. Just loading the hell up with fluids. They're going to get liters and liters and liters of fluids. Well, if you push one or two liters by the time you get to the hospital, you're just, you're just putting a drop in the bucket. So for those of you that are kind of like picking up what I'm trying to put down here, it's one, it's one thing to have the nice theory and I'm all about knowing the nerd shit, right? But it's really important to know uh, what you actually will have with you in your pocket when you're on a scene because we won't have that. None of us carries an x-ray out in the field. We don't have a spiral CT. We don't have freaking troponin exams. So when you do your assessment, a lot of it's going to depend on can you remember the characteristics that make it more likely to be this or that based on what you could tell in the field with no tools? Because that's what you do in real life. And then, of course, because it's all great if you call the hospital and say, oh, yeah, I got a patient in HHS, blah, 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 blah. What are you going to do about it? Huh. I don't know. You need to know what you're going to do, too. And the good answer is monitor ABCs. Give them fluids, reassess, and oh, don't forget to check them for other shit, especially if it's TJ checking you. Because a lot of times they'll have other stuff going on, like they might have infection or whatever. Because remember, they're pissing out sugar. If it's an old person, that infection may be freaking horrible. If they're altered, make sure to check everything. So uh, coming back to dystonic reaction, Christopher Fox. I love catching you. What were you watching? What porn channel? I mean, I've got four screens up here. You have no idea what I'm watching. <laughs> the only reason I'm stuck is I have to keep talking, so I can't. Oh, I can't. Oops, all right, go back to this. So, so I, dystonic reaction. Um, I wanted to show you the video of that. Who's seen one, by the way? Michael Moore. What was it like? Tell me about the call. It was one of my first 911 ride alongs and he'd like, um, it was a psych medication. I forgot the name of it, but he had taken it like a few days ago, a few days prior, I think. And um, he, he had the jaw tugging. That was his main thing. He, he, his speech was like super weird. I was like, this guy's like, this guy's super weird. He's talking really funny. I, I thought like maybe he was on some sort of drugs. Uh -huh. And then, um, it was like a super experienced medic and he caught it like almost immediately and he, he gave him the Benadryl and just slowly just started coming like right back to normal speech and just started talking like you and I. And it, it was super cool to see, um, see how, uh, how well the Benadryl worked for it. But um, yeah, I think it, it ended up being a, a psych medication. Can you make the, can you mimic the expression you had on his face? It was like kind of like this. Like his jaw was tugged to one side. And which way was he looking? The more realistic it is, the funnier you look. So keep eyes, going. It just like his jaw was like really tugged. Okay. 
So good, good catch on that. Good thing you had a medic. It's, you don't see those very often anymore. A lot of the uh, triggering meds that we used to have a lot of, they basically moved on. Who else has seen one? Was that you, Robert? Okay, I'm gonna share a screen to show you. It's, a, it's the most iconic one. Um, and, but if you haven't seen this before, it's also again in the videos. Check this poor slob out. So, when did, when did you start having trouble talking? Uh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, Early this morning? Uh, and did you take any drugs? Uh, uh, other, uh, other than your prescribed drugs? Oh. Uh, no? You don't do cocaine or anything like that? Oh, uh, 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 No? Uh, okay. Count to ten for me. One, two, Okay. That was super similar. So but, you hear what no. the doc was doing? I'm sorry, I did not cut you off, but the doc was kind of doing a quick stroke scale in between. You kind of mixing and matching his stuff with the counting thing. And also because he's so hard to understand, he wanted to make sure the guy is not randomly answering questions because it's hard to understand them, but is he obedient with his speech? He could have asked to repeat an old, uh, repeat the phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but that's a really dick move for this guy. So give him something where you can follow and give him a half-assed chance, okay? You, you, you get that part. So what was his LOC? Oriented. He was, yeah, he was oriented in 04, like, Alert. He's a and o times four, but can you see where he might look altered to someone else? Yeah. Okay. So this is again that whole being the right medic. And usually the history is easy. It's a new onset med. They were, they were given Haldol, Compazine, freaking Phenergan, almost any of the psychotropic meds that are acute meds, they, they, this will happen sometime after. The very first call I had with this, it was a chick in a car. And they call, called for neck pain. And we're all thinking, oh, crash, neck pain, shit like that. Parked on the side of the road, she's doing this number here. What's wrong? My neck is hurting. Why? Did you crash? No. She pulled over because she started to have these freaking spasms. And the neck was hurting because of the torticollis, basically this. Really commonly pulled one way or the other. And I was like... Usual, like, you know, and if you saw inside my head, everything went flat asystole for a second in my brain, like, huh, never seen this before. So the next thing I ask is the obvious question. Are you taking any new medications? I'm trying to find out what changed in her life that led to this. And she goes, uh-huh. What are you taking? Oh, the thing. Why? I'm pregnant for nausea. How long are you taking it? Three days. And at that point, it was like, bing, 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 bing. Pull out the Benadryl, and it's like giving Narcan to a druggie or dextrose to uh, a, a, a hypoglycemic who's altered. Snaps them out of it like that. And the last call I had was some 12-year-old kid, neck pain. And uh, can you guys see me okay? I'll kind of try to pretend. We pull up in the parking lot. It's at a shithole hotel where people pay by the week. And uh, this kid's walking around like this here. I know he's doing this over here. Can you guys see my head and neck? Uh, uh, sort of. No, no. Uh, squat a little more. Body. Okay. Better? Let's pop that squat. Uh, there we go. Better. All right. So I'm presenting. And he's like this here. And his mom is with him, and she's like a tweaker or something. But anyways, his kid's like walking around like this. What's wrong? And he's like, my neck is hurting. Because the muscles start to go into spasm. Imagine if you held that. So I didn't want to get gamed on this guy because it's kind of a shithole neighborhood. Like, all right, you know, you take any medications. His mom says, yeah, we got some Haldol. And I looked at the kid and says, those are really cool shoes. What color shoelaces are you wearing? But I was testing to see if he'd do this. And he couldn't move at all. He tried, but he like stopped right where he was. Gave him Benadryl. In that case, he's a kid. So just give him one milligram per kilogram. Bam, done. I showed you the assessment trick because real, real medicine 
So you, you're going to get gamed sometimes. And I don't care if I get gamed. It's like, yeah, you got me. Good job. You know, chalk it up the next time. But it's also an assessment tool. So you'll see these and it's, you might see one every few years. But it's good to know what they are because otherwise they look like a stroke. So what do you do for your treatment and assessment of a patient like this? Assessment, I'm sorry. Everything. Check the glucose, check the temp, check the crap. Maybe don't do a 12 lead. That, that'd be probably pretty stupid. Because guess what can present like this? Hypoglycemia. No history of diabetes whatsoever. Posturing, slurred speech, completely oriented, because these guys are always oriented, unless you have other drugs on board. We had no freaking idea what was wrong with them, but we like, what else? We got nothing else in our box of rocks. Let's check his blood sugar. It's 23. No meds, no history, no allergies, normal skin signs, positive Babinski's reflex bilaterally, decerebral posturing, slurred speech, paralyzed. How many hypoglycemics have you seen like that? Yeah. I have actually haven't seen any. Exactly. Neither have I. So had I not checked him, this guy would have been treated like something completely different. God only knows what. So what I'm making, the point I'm making here is don't guess, check. It's too easy. Too easy to check. Sir, did you transport, did you transport these two dystonic patients? No, I dry run them afterwards. They're done. They're fixed. Go okay. see the doctor. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if they want to go to the hospital, I'll take anyone. But most of the time, once they know what it is, it's like, oh, shit. The one not to get confused on, I didn't get into this, but it was actually brought up to me. Have you, who, how many people go to con homes and see this kind of patient? What is that called? Oh, good. I'm going to have to put this in next week. Tardine, which means, I looked it up and I already forgot, so I got to look it up again. Dyskinesia. Those are the people that are long-term, like psych meds. Yeah, doing well. They have the, they call it the fly catcher tongue. They just keep that smacking. They're always like, nom, 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 stuff like that. The reason I mention that is if you mistake that for a dystonic reaction and give them Benadryl, you'll actually make it worse. So dystonic reaction is typically acute. It started suddenly, not something they have all the time. It's almost always in association with a medicine that's for like Haldol or antiemetic. Um, and it's like a kind of posturing or weird, like, you know, lock position with the face, shoulders or whatever. It's sometimes the eyes, the eyes will do this number here. They just do that, but they're conscious. They're talking with you. Tardive, it's a smack, lip smacking, lizard mouth, bug fly catching tongue. Stuff like that, it's chronic. Don't mistake that for dystonic reaction. It's actually a different type of dyskinesia. So, um, of the conditions right now, we've got a few more conditions to go over. I'm gonna put those as part of essentially the uh, homework side. I've learned how to put the videos now for next class, like a create an assignment. So it's a, like a room just for those videos instead of where they all now jammed up in one place. So thanks to IT. Um, but before we go on, you forced my hand and I need the YouTube hits. So we're going to watch the latest and greatest director in history videos because on the videos you did for the stroke, what did I ask for on the stroke uh, assessment video? Uh, description and performance of labs. Okay, what was I did not, it was not written anywhere in there. But I know you, you could tell that because based on the video, what were the six steps and which sheet are those steps found on? The assessment sheet. Our assessment sheet. The assessment sheet, assessment sheet. okay. And you guys remember me demonstrating that in class? Yes, sir. Okay, and I demonstrated from beginning to end. Um, and it's a really fast assessment and it has components of both the MLAPS 
and the Cincinnati stroke screen. It's just a stroke screen. But if you did those steps, you'll catch like 90, 95, 97% of these strokes. Okay, what I got is some very creative work, some artsy work. Uh, uh, your class president was an asshole towards his wife, but he was actually accurate work. Okay, and I haven't got through all of them, but I <laughs> wanted you to check that specific thing. So I put this video up for you at nighttime. I'm like, oh God, this isn't going to work. Because remember, the video isn't there to give you a project. It isn't there for YouTube and it isn't there for entertainment. It's there for you to show you know what the hell you're doing. So for those of you that got it right, again, I haven't gotten through all of them. Good. That's the point. But for the majority, all but one I've seen so far have been everywhere from off to way off. So I did this video for you, unscripted, and in one take. So this better be the coolest, most awesome video you ever saw. Okay, so let's go look at that. And even look at the background, except they did reverse letters. I was so proud of this. Quick is seven minutes. I know you just told me when I was an adult and be a full professional using the assessment sheets that you're not 60. Um, the six basic tests of this screen, and there are many that can be done. Uh, narrowed down to six tests that can be done in pre-hospital that cover the Cincinnati and LA a stroke scale uh, pretty well. Our facial symmetry, upper motor, lower motor, uh, proprioception and pronator drift, uh, slurring of speech, which is kind of a motor for speaking. Um, then there is the uh, Vernon Keys and Broca's area of speech, which is essentially the ability to understand and repeat what is heard. And so the facial symmetry is pretty easy. Um, you have the person, if they're in a good mood or cooperative, you can ask them to smile or just show their teeth. And you're looking for, again, uh, asymmetry from one side to the other. And if it's, for example, in a stroke, you should be able to see wrinkling, regardless of this side of the face, you see it's wrinkling there. If it's uh, Bell's palsy, then you would, for example, see just smooth on that one side of the face and no other findings in the rest of the body. Um, so that's a factor, and I expect if I see asymmetry on the side of the face, they're almost always slurring, and that is natural because the muscles that control the throat and face are all affected, and that would affect the ability to speak clearly. However, the person would be able to speak, or at least they're you know they're they're putting things together in the right way, and you can usually tell. <clears throat> slurring is obvious immediately when you go on a call with a stroke patient. You almost don't have to ask about slurring. It just you hear it by the way. Or the people who called you will be able to tell you their speech has changed. Upper motor is uh, the standard is going to be grips. Uh, normally, you just give them you know a couple of fingers or one finger to have them squeeze. Um, and you want to ask them to squeeze and check for weakness on one side compared to the other. And, if there is one side weaker than the other, you want to find out if that was new or do they have residual weakness from, say, a previous stroke. Um, lower motor is the same thing. You're looking for anything that's testing the feet, whether it's pushes or pulls or lifting their legs. Uh, pedal pushes and pulls is easiest because lifting a leg strains the back and a lot of people can actually cause pain and give a false positive for weakness. So pushing and pulling and touch sensation because you're down there, you can ask that easily is again uh, an easy check and you're looking for differences and if the difference is new or not. <clears throat> the subtle one is uh, proprioception. So with the grips and pedal pushes, we don't care what the eyes are doing because these are strength tests. They're checking strength motor control. However, when we're talking about proprioception, we're looking at having the patient be able to basically keep their hands in front of them, for example, and to check upper motor neuron from lower where it is supinating the grip, so it's supinating the hands. Then you ask them to close their eyes, and they close their eyes in short order. They will either be able to keep their hands like this, or you will notice a drift, or they'll just drop, or it may go up. Okay, any of those findings is wrong. Why do we have them close the eyes? Well, proprioception is the ability to know where you are in space and time without having to see. So if I have to see where my hands are to keep them in place, but as soon as I close my eyes, I don't know where they are and they start to go all over the place. Well, this is a problem. 
a significant problem. It will not show up as a motor issue. I could have perfectly strong grips, but I don't have good control. Other subtle ways to check that, of course, you could do nose touching, nose touching to your fingers back and forth and compare. That gets into more detailed assessments. You can play around that with that in routes, but it's not really, it's not a part of this again, this assessment in particular. So it's pronating and drifting. Pronating and drifting, or you could just have drift, drooping, or going up. Either one of those, any one of those is bad. The next was slurring of speech, which you already kind of covered. Uh, you would just be in your introduction or talking to the patient uh, to pick up on that. So that doesn't need any further um, uh, clarification. The really uh, tricky one uh, is in the patient who's not answering you in full sentences or uh, they answer in one or two or three word sentences, basically nothing that is, stands out. However, uh, if you ask them to repeat a phrase, uh, for example, you need to teach a video for class today. Sir, ma'am, uh, I'd like you to repeat this phrase and repeat the phrase, I love teaching video classes. And the patient goes, I love teaching video classes. Good. That means they heard you and they can say what they want to say. Um, if you said, for example, I want to go to the beach today, can you repeat the phrase, I want to go to the beach today? And the patient goes, I want to teach to class today. Okay? Good, you're good. You can try it again. I want to go to the beach today. Always give them the second chance because as students will show, they display signs of stroke every day in class when they're practicing this. Give them a chance to say it again. I want to go to the beach today. I want to, to go to the beach to okay. No, I understand you're trying to say it and the wrong words are coming out and the patient oftentimes will be like that they are now they're scared or they're nervous because they just realized that they can't say what they want to say. And this is a really scary position for a patient because well imagine people can't understand you because you can't communicate. It's like you speak a foreign language to everyone else. No one understands you and even worse, they don't realize you're speaking in a foreign language. They just think you don't make any sense that you're altered. So that is a positive finding. <clears throat> Always with all stroke assessments to kind of differentiate between say a TIA and an actual ongoing stroke, you want to reassess this during transport. You would reassess this and reassess this several times as you would with a concussion and see if they get better. Uh, one time I had a patient who would get better and then get bad again. Better and then get bad again. Literally seven times they went essentially into a kind of stroke and then would come out of it. So technically those were all TIAs, but this was emergent enough that it, it required getting this across to the emergency department staff. This is not a TIA type of patient. And um, the next thing is if you have a patient who can't get anything across uh, and they can't communicate, try having them communicate by writing. Use them, confirm that they understand things like, for example, can you just tell them, would you hold up three fingers for me? and they can hold up three fingers, all right? This tells you that they're understanding you, even if what you hear is gibberish coming back. It is super important to make sure the patient knows that you understand. They can't communicate, but you're gonna take care of them, continue on the rest of your assessment and reassessments, um, and then make sure any receiving staff understands the patient is not altered. They just have essentially, in this case, expressive aphasia. So, um, Hopefully that sums it all up, and I'll conclude this presentation. Hi, Lord, this is Tony, and I'm gonna go over the uh, focus. Okay, Barker, where are you? How was that facial droop? Was that freaking badass? I made myself look at a convincing stroke. Okay, what did you see on that video what, that was new to you, that you don't remember? Real quick, because I wanna get through this in the next few minutes. Did the video cover the six elements? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, just as important, did the video give you something that we don't really learn and we don't emphasize in school enough? You know, there's some vital signs that you automatically see taken over and over again, like blood pressures, because your machine does it for you automatically. And your paperwork asks for it automatically. 
But if you go on your uh, on your PCR, it doesn't ask you to do a second stroke assessment. It doesn't say what's changing. So it's real important to check that. And um, that part about the speech, I wasn't kidding. Just like when I asked you in class, like Jonathan Corretto, you repeat this phrase, I can't wait to get out of class right now. I can't wait to get out of class right now. Okay, see how much of a struggle that was? So when a patient botches it, don't freaking freak them out. And you actually did it okay, but you like took up like three minutes to think about it, okay? Is, you know, okay, go ahead and try it again. You don't wanna get a false positive, all right? So that there video is there. Um, learn it um, because it's good information, but I'm also here to tell you that's not the end all, okay? But remember in the pre-hospital world, we're not trying to diagnose what part of the brain the stroke's happening in. We're trying to figure out do they need to go to a stroke center or not and let the guys with high price, high price tools do it. Where you do make a difference is you could say, oh, they've gotten better. Now it may not be a code stroke anymore, but they'll just follow up with a neurologist. Or in the case of that one chick I took to Kaiser, seven TIAs in a row, they were gonna push her off to the basically waiting room. And uh, I was really pissed off. I was like, no, you, she, you need to treat her like she's a stroke. Cause she had one, she'll have one again. So that's, that's being a patient advocate. Now the next one here, this is a little shorter. Hey, my name is Tony and I'm here to talk about Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is a uh, condition that is considered to be relatively benign in the sense that it is not lethal um, and it uh, often heals on its own, but it can be really a problem for the person experiencing it. Um, and it could take months or years to heal and uh, it can leave permanent damage in terms of affected facial muscles. I wanted to say first out, shout out to Robert Bot uh, Botker because he had the whole skull and the anatomy out there and the nerve change that I thought was outstanding. Um, and that actually kind of gave me the idea for this really, really cool screen background, which I'm sure you're gonna run home and tell your family about. You can imagine if it warps your face, affects your speech, affects your ability to close your eyes, for example, it's gonna affect your life in a lot of different ways. So it's serious in the sense of the impact it has on a person. Uh, as far as for the purposes of this presentation, uh, the big deal is Bell's palsy affects the face and facial expression and droop is also a big uh, finding in many types of stroke. And in EMS, one of the things we're looking for are strokes and figuring out where to take them and how to treat them. So how do you differentiate the two? Well, looking at the normal face to my left here, you see the uh, woman and she has the uh, facial nerve coming down and that seven facial nerve, it affects the entire side of the face, the upper and lower part. And if you look, uh, for example, when the bell palsy hits, uh, you see that nerve is affected and it affects the upper and lower sides of the face. So, <clears throat> a stroke, on the other hand, it's going to hit an upper motor nerve, and that comes to the lower part of the face, as you can see, leaving the upper part of the head or the forehead basically intact. So coming on to <clears throat> Bell's palsy and differentiating it from a stroke. Well, a stroke we know can happen from typically a, a clot in the brain. Uh, it can happen in bad cases to a bleed. And sometimes you can have stroke-like symptoms caused by a mass of some sort, like a tumor or infection in the brain. Bell's palsy, on the other hand, is damage or something affecting the seventh cranial nerve. No one knows exactly why it happens, but it's been associated with blood trauma, it's been associated with pregnancy and preeclampsia, and a, a number of infections. So the treatment is also pretty nonspecific and uh, basically is beyond the scope of this video. So if you're the medic and you come on scene and you have the complaint of facial droop, how do you tell the difference? Well, again, looking at the Bell's palsy patient to the left, one of the big findings is that you have an entire loss of function or loss of function on one side of the face. So that means the forehead muscle, like you try to make, you know, squinch, like make forehead wrinkling, it won't happen on that left side. 
The other thing is they can't close that eye. And uh, because they can't close the eye, the eye gets really irritated and starts getting really watery. Uh, because the left side of their mouth may be messed up, it could affect their speech and cause some uh, slurring of speech and also drooling. So imagine you went to the dentist and they give you a super long acting anesthetic and now you can't control that side of your mouth. And of course, they talk about the nasal labial fold, which is right here. Well, that kind of flattens out because again, the muscles that allow you to, for example, wiggle your nose um, aren't working on that side. <clears throat> on the stroke side, you look back here and you see that the lower face, because it's uh, the cranial nerve, is affected and may be uh, causing that droop that we are all used to seeing and it can affect the muscles around the eye, but typically the forehead muscles will be able to work in the stroke. <clears throat> and then the other big thing is if you have a stroke affecting one side of the face, it's almost certain you're going to have other signs and symptoms throughout the body. For example, inability or weakening, weakness or loss of strength or proprioception in one of the arms and one of the legs or both. So, Bell's pulp. Almost done, folks. Um, that video there. Convey the stuff. Do you get the kind of important part as far as distinguishing the two? And why does the eye get irritated? Uh, Tyson, uh, Ty's Teague. They mentioned irritation, but in wateriness, but you know, why do you think that is? Because of the facial nerve? Nope. Constantly open. If someone held your eye open constantly, see how long your eye <laughs> takes for a Can't start control to your eyelids. Yeah. And when your eye starts to get irritated and dry, what is it going to try to do to help with that? Water. 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 Try to clean itself off. It becomes, and it's not even a comfortable feeling, it's a different type of tear. It just gets really watery, and you know that if it keeps running long enough, it'll start to get irritated, dry, and get red. So again, putting pieces together, why is the eye irritated? So if you had a person with Bell's palsy, what might you do to help them with that eye discomfort if they can't do it themselves? Put eye patch on? Just basically just close the eye. A little bit of tape if they want to, or have them hold it. Comfort that. Small stuff, right? But it could be a big thing. Just again, think golden rule. What if that was you? What if that was your mom? What's that your wife? All right, so always think that when you're treating someone, you are treating someone's mom, daughter, wife, sister, grandmother. Keep that always in your head and that will help you not get burned out. It is not always successful. Some people, you don't care if they die. But I'm talking about people that right now, these are the people you want to help. Okay, so. Uh, Mr. Yep. So if you were to get like a Bell's palsy patient and you're not 100% 100% sure that's Bell, Bell's palsy, would you still maybe call the hospital and know it could possibly be a stroke? Or oh, I'd certainly or call them in. Yeah, absolutely. The question is, do I call them in? I'm not trying to play I'm rocket science guy. But I call the stroke center and I call, say, is RUHS a stroke center? That's right. They say they are. So I'm going to call RUHS so they can in turn call Loma Linda when they float the patient right back out. Say, RUHS, I'm on a freaking 35-year-old female complaining of right facial droop. We went ahead and did a stroke assessment and she's negative for any other findings except for right facial droop. She's also got signs of Bell's palsy in the sense that she has the forehead is also completely smoothed out. She's unable to close her eyes. And this happened suddenly, and there are no other corroborating vital signs. If you want, I can bring her to you guys, but I don't think she's a stroke. So just uh, kind of like let them know, assume yeah. like the worst. Or you, assume the... you want to not get them to jump because when you activate yeah, a team, that's... it costs a fortune to the hospital. Not only yeah. that, it's a little bit like calling Wolf. So if you have an opinion, you know, let them know. They may... Well, if you don't sound like you're really sure, they may say, just bring her in here anyways. I sure as Shane ain't going to drive in their code three. Yeah. And if they say come in code three, I'll say, okay, we're going code two. All right. 
but be you know be humble if you're not sure say i'm not sure but it looks a lot like bell's palsy but once you've seen enough strokes you'll start to figure it out strokes are pretty much in your face for the standard stroke all right so your job is to convey what you think and also just as fairly as to say you know what i'm not sure this could be bell's palsy it could be a stroke well if i'm thinking it could it could be i'm just going to go with the stroke but if i'm damn sure i'm going to say yeah it looks like bell's palsy to me and then they can make the decision that's one of those perfect cases where you're calling the hospital to ask for their input and really how they react is going to be based on how good your assessment is and your ability to articulate that okay. does that answer your question yeah that does essentially and, and because this is real, it's a really good question because half of what you do in the field as a medic is try to talk to the hospital and figure out what you're gonna do, ask them for crap and everything else. Just like again, uh, call the hospital and say, he stroked out, we'll see you in five minutes. Well, what about this, this and that? He's a stroke. We'll call you later, bye. Now, if you're gonna do that, you better know what you're doing because <laughs> you're taking ass ripping for it. But when you get good enough or you're really sure, you will know when to do that. Because you can't let the hospital get in the way of your actions too. You have to say, listen, we got stuff to do. I'll call you back. And I'll tell you what, I've yet to have a nurse so much as say a bad word about it ever when you get there. They're not stupid. They know that there's a point where you got to you cut loose. So let them know the ETA and how severe they are in general nature of the call. I'm only going to talk about the last bit of the GI bleed. All right, all of you. I will say all of you that I checked, I haven't checked Joanna's, you're gonna be the next one I check. Stab me in the heart with a rusty pair of shears attached to a taser wiring system, dipped in acid and washed off with freaking fresh turds and then twisted them a little bit. But everyone, their pulse ox goes down. It feels like I spent weeks explaining the difference between a drop and sat. Why did I give you all those formulas, those blood checks? Your FiO2 is this, your hemoglobin is that. What do you think the purpose for all those arithmetic problems was? To make you use your calculator? No, I've got better stuff to do than that. The intent was lesson learned. To make you kind of see, because math is a tool, is like, oh, this is what affects saturation. And saturation really has little to do with oxygen content. Your sats could be super high, but your oxygen amount could be very low if your red blood cell count is low. And hemoglobin is what red blood cells carry to carry oxygen, right? Does this ring a bell or is it like, am I, did I ever say this before in my life? I already know Grill has never heard this before, but I'm just going out on a limb there. So with this guy, what he had was you went on him because he had essentially hypovolemia, possibly orthostatic hypotension. So in your assessment, when you have someone who's volume deficient, how do you assess that in the field? We don't have a central venous pressure line. What is a field tool we have to check if someone's hypovolemic? Orthostatics. Orthostatics, outstanding. We got a, 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 a container that's partially empty and it's like a glass that you can't quite tell how full it is from this side, so you lift it over and no, crap, it's on the bottom. Orthostatic vitals. That's your field expedient way of checking because what are you looking for? The pulse rate to go up and if it's really bad, BP changes. It's just like uh, now if we give them fluids and their pulse rate goes down, what have we kind of proven? They were volume depleted, right? Vital signs and treatments are a language. And if you don't understand what you're checking, you're not gonna really know what to do. So in this kid here, probably orthostatically hypotensive because he's been losing blood and presumably fluids. I forget what he said about his urination. 
but that would be the thing you might check. Have you been peeing less? It's hard to say because he was bleeding over a period of weeks. People tend to compensate. They, they make up the liquids. So now that's why he uh, that's why he kept passing out when he was trying to get dressed for school because he was standing up. Correct. That's what I'm guessing. Obviously, the video wasn't given. I'm trying to contact his father because I want to find out what the actual values were for this 2011. So if you uh, when I asked you that pulse ox question, that was obviously a hint. Do you expect to be high low normal? In hypotension and rather in hemorrhagic shock, whether it's from GI bleed or otherwise the initial tendency is for the SA, SPO2 to go up. Anyone care to guess why that is? Do you guys, uh, did you, do you, does anyone understand the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve yet? I remember the video, yes. I, I did, I missed the question, sorry, sir. That's okay, that was, a, that was an older one, Mr. Kassar, so cover with you. But just so you know, there's a method to the madness. When your red blood cells and your hemoglobin is delivering oxygen to the body, it holds the oxygen really tightly. I'm not letting it go. So my sack stays up because I'm carrying all that oxygen literally like this, a cup. That's a left word shift. My blood is alkaline, my temperature's down, I have low 2, 3 GP, okay? Now I get to the distal tissues, my working tissues. Well, guess what the pH of the working tissues probably is? A little lower. Guess what the oxygen content of the serum is? A little lower. lower. What the temperature is in working muscles? Lower, lower, higher. So now as I'm getting there as a waitress, I'm the red blood cell waitress coming through. I'm like, hey, buddies, you want some of this oxygen? Blam, you can grab it. My conformal coat, the way I held on to that oxygen molecule just got loose. I'm like the cheap poker waiting to get pinched up. Take me. That's a rightward shift. I'm giving it up. It's the right thing to do. So guess what? When this guy became hypovolemic and hemorrhagically compromised, what happened to his respiratory rate? It went up. When he goes into respiratory alkalosis, what happens to his pH? It shifts up. And what does that do to the pulse ox reading? Because the oxygen is being stuck to the hemoglobin harder, Doesn't my sat goes up. Mm -hmm. oh. I love it, Robert. I freaking love it. Perfect. I still so, don't get it. Almost done. I, five minutes. So this is an important distinction, but remember the red blood cells aren't what's giving oxygen to your body. It's the oxygen diffused in your blood that came off those red blood cells. Remember the carbon dioxide in your soda, you shake it, it bubbles up. Oxygen the same way. That oxygen does go down, but we don't check that in the field. We only have a pulse ox. And the hospital has SAO2, but the hospital can check the PO2 as well, and that's diffusing oxygen, different thing. Point of that lesson, don't, if you don't understand, that's what Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is for, or you can read it, but the book doesn't do a good job explaining it. If you don't understand, you've got the resources. You're looking at one, you can ask whoever the hell you like. It doesn't have to be me. But you don't want to go on that patient and say they don't need oxygen or they're fine because their pulse ox reading is good. Because in fact, the pulse ox is going to hold the, the sat, the uh, oxyhemoglobin curve is going to shift to the left because the red blood cells are hanging onto the oxygen and actually become stingy to a degree until you get to like terminal shock. So the last part about this, because this actually Watching those videos and feeling the shears twist around in my heart, then give me a reverse fucking harakiri and dismember me from the inside out. I thought, well, what the hell? How the heck can you convey this? And it's going to be this other answer. 
VQ mismatch. Think about conditions that will drop your saturation that you measure by pulse oximetry. Something that affects the lungs or something that affects the blood flow through the lungs. What are diseases that affect the lungs? Diffusion of the lungs? Pneumonia. COPD, emphysema. COPD, emphysema, pulmonary Asthma. edema. Okay. PE. P, okay, so that's the, the we talked about is the V side, the lung side, okay? okay? Anything that screws up the fusion of gases from the tissue, whether it's the lungs getting flooded, infected, swollen, inflamed, losing surface area, um, alveolar collapse, that will affect the ability of oxygen to get into the, red, the bloodstream. That'll drop your sat. Okay. Now, who said PE? If we don't have the waitresses swinging by to pick up their friggin' load of oxygen because they're getting cock blocked by an embolism or because of hypoxic vasoconstriction or something that screws up the blood flow to the lungs they can't pick up oxygen. They continue on through the left side of the heart, get squirted out, run around with a half full tray. What does that cause to your sat? A drop. Lower. What about a tension pneumothorax? Yeah, what does a tension pneumothorax do to you? Collapse lungs. So Collapses one lung. Well, yeah. the lung is collapsed, but what does it do to blood return to the right side of the heart? Shunts it. It kills your, it's a B and a Q mismatch. It's like both of them. Mm -hmm. Crashes the lung and it kills blood flow through. That's why it can kill you so fast. I've never seen it personally. I suspect they were PEAs and dead by the time we got there. But one of our, our favorite physician instructors, he said, if you get a right tension pneumo, they can literally go down in half a dozen breaths. It's like they literally collapse their lung that fast if it's a bad enough valve. So try to think about that a little bit because this is something that honestly I did not realize until this week. Because of the trauma, I was like, how, what does cause SATs to drop in people? It's something that's fucking up the lung, CHF, pneumonia. Okay, emphysema, asthma. Not bronchitis so much because that's bronchioles, unless it shuts down. Anything that affects the lungs, that's a V. Anything that kills the blood going through the lungs, that's a Q. So the last part is uh, someone mentioned, I think it was TJ. So what happens to a pulse ox reading in a severe hemorrhagic shock? They have shunting, right? If you shunt enough, what happens to your capture on your pulse ox? goes down, you lose your capture. You are more likely to lose your pulse ox reading or it does like in the hospital, it goes to 277 because it's all erratic, it's catching crap. That's why in your pulse ox, you have to make sure it's capturing and it's matching your heart rate. And if you have a monitor, better to have the pleth reading because that'll tell you really well if the pulse ox reading is worth re uh, trusting. When it goes down, you will have so little perfusion because of shunting that you won't have a pulse ox capture. Would you be able to get a, on a severe like hemorrhagic, um, say shock patient like that and they're bleeding profusely and they're shunting and you, you start losing SpO2 readings on the finger. Uh, for some reason you had one, could you get an SpO2 reading off of an earlobe? Yeah, I have that in my ditty bag. I carry it on the ambulance with me. But I hate to say it, despite spending $200 on a goddamn adapter, it doesn't seem to work very well. Well, because we started carrying like the, uh, the sticky rubber or the uh, like Band-Aid ones, like the tape ones for the peds. Could you use something like that? Yeah, use anything. If you've got it, use it. The one Dr. Davis is working on, but he's not putting out a lot because he wants the money, is one that fits in your ear like a shooting ear plug. So it goes deep in the ear. Because even the earlobe, you get, I haven't had really good luck with those, even though they're specifically designed for trauma patients. For some reason, it just doesn't seem to work. And I have, a, the, you know, the best made pulse oximeter that you can buy. So it's really the sensor that's the issue. 
And that's why an SAO2 or v, VBO2, oh, I'm sorry, SAO2 or VAO2, a v, SVO2, basically you have to do an invasive blood sat to be sure in, in critical patients because the capture of the peripheral shunting becomes a problem. So does, with the exception of Matthew Barber, do you guys feel, do you have this down a bit better? Because I'll have to say it again. But um, if you get this to where you understand it, I know you're sick and tired of hearing this, but it freaking is why I'm explaining it this way. If you understand why shit is happening, you're not going to be able to put it all, the way, all together right now. That's too much to ask. But keep trying. That's where you look back on calls. How do I explain what I saw? And you will find out that PEs, pneumonias, pulmonary edemas, they're the ones who have shit for a saturation. And the hemorrhagic shocks, the anemias, they're the ones who have good saturations, but they may well be hypoxemic, beware. And that's it. So don't just learn, don't just study, understand. I put those videos up for you. They're good videos, they're cheap, they're easy, and most of all, they're accurate. As far as production quality, tough. You didn't pay me. So uh, I'll let you go with that. I know I'm sorry for running a little longer, but it was very important to get these. And uh, this week's assignments, I'm just going to send you out the remaining stuff uh, for the ultra LOC bit. Next week, it's going to be starting abdominal and assessments and pain assessment, because that's kind of be kind of hand on. And we'll kind of go back to chapter 11 with the physical assessment, because that's something where most EMS suck. We just kind of paddle someone and grope and squeeze and rub them, but don't really know what the hell we're doing, we're doing it. So that's important. Anyone who wants to stay on after, you're welcome for 10 minutes. The wife has been yelling at me for the past 20 minutes to get off the phone, off the computer. So thanks for your time. Please let some of this stuff stick in. Thank you, sir. Ciao. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank Copy that. Now, nah, bye. Thank you, sir. Did the gorilla leave yet? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. So, ciao. Yes, sir. I'll see you, Mr. Ritchie. I think I need to watch some more videos. Watch the videos, and it, it, because I don't, I, I don't know how it is with you, but some of the videos, even the Alila videos, like the respiratory pump, I had to watch it like four times. Gotcha. But that's only because there's so many moving parts. But if you watch it, you're kind of patient. And the other one they have on the right heart block, you know, in cardiology, you probably looked at like looking at the rabbit ears and which is doing what. Their video shows it so freaking well. It's almost like this is brilliant. Which one is that? It. That's it. Alila uh, uh, videos on heart blocks and stuff. Like for the first time when I watched it, I could see what happened to the signal and why V1 looked the way it did because it shows like the signal bouncing here, going there. It's like the graphics on Alila videos are amazing uh, because nothing explains cardiology to me as well as they do. Um, it, so it, it, but it, you can't just, unless you're a genius, you can't just watch that video once and get it. Uh, you may have to watch it a few times and these videos are short, but again, it's, it comes down to that if you, if you don't understand it, you just like looked at it and I get it, but then you never think about it again, you'll forget it. Then go look at it again. And eventually you remember it. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. You are you. totally smart enough to do this, but you know your limits. You're going to have to put serious effort in. Mm -hmm. But I promise you this, like learning a language, the more effort you put in now, the easier it gets. But you have to get over this hump. It is totally like learning a language. Why do I pick up shit in medicine so fast now? Because I've learned all the basic stuff so well so many times that now pieces are clicking without me even trying very hard. But if you don't kind of understand from the bottom up, you're always going to be like, I'm not really sure anymore. Like that foundation. Kind of remember crap. Yeah. Now, this is where you guys are helping me. Believe me, me struggling to explain it. I have to like look at it like how the hell, like I got it now, but how do I explain it? Mm -hmm. Wait till you have kids. You have to <laughs> shit to them, you're going to have the same thing. Why is a manhole cover round? You guys have any idea? 
Wait, what? Fire manhole covers round. Well, it's also kind of like um like gas cylinders. When it's in a circle, it distributes the weight. That's fair enough, but manhole covers are built far heavier than they need to be for the surface area. Why are they round instead of, say, a triangle or a perfect square? This is the perfect example of mechanistic, of like logic, of reasoning. And I tortured my daughter. She hated me, but she asked her an hour. She figured it out. Let me know what you come up with. I'm not going to give you the answer because that totally insults you. Mm -hmm. But think about it. Think about what a manhole cover does, what you don't want it to do, and why round is the perfect shape for it. Okay, I'll text you my answer. <laughs> Great I, I question. Really look forward to it. And uh, uh, do you, if you have questions before I log off. Uh, do you think you could do another Zoom meeting, like, I don't know, Saturday? I don't know how busy yeah, you are. I, like I said, I'm keeping shit open. I'm not making it up. It, All right, I'm well. I'm not picking up shifts at AMR because I'm trying to stay open till the last minute. But um, what I also need you guys to do is consider – uh, practicing if you need physical practice, because you can ask theory questions while we're at practice as well. Yeah, um, we're actually meeting up tomorrow at Ben Clark. Good. Who's going to so, be uh, Who's going to be your uh, proctor then? I'm not too sure who's going to be there, but I know that we're going to go. I think Fontaine cleared us. Okay. Yeah. Hey, since he's technically an employee now. No, I know. Yeah, I talked to TJ. Could do that. It's a matter of. If you guys want to run your scenarios or do whatever, that's perfectly fine. Um, and so, it, again, it comes down to, I mean, by all means, use each other. But there's there's always the risk of, because of the, like, you're not going to be testing you and grading you when you do your physical assessment in December. So it's worthwhile having one of the proctors or two of the proctors watch because can, we're going to pick the stuff that you don't see that you're missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, you want to, it's back to that perfect practice or just practice. You want to get the right practice and get the feedback uh, because otherwise it's a much slower process. Yeah. I think TJ is going to call me afterwards because of that. That may be why he wants to call me. Yeah. Well, if you could meet up Saturday, that would be great. Like last time, the whole, the whole meeting you had last week when we were in the sauna, it really helped me and it helped me with even with Casares' thing. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't, like I said, the way you explain things is I, I understand them. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, now I get it. The whole CBP and how the lungs work. Like, I, I didn't really understand it when Casares was explaining that to me. It's because it's too much like, once. What, what was that? Sometimes it's too much. He He's kind of coming from. There's a lot of nurses that would have trouble understanding. They're not that smart either. Half the videos you see are made by nurses in school, making videos for nurses in school. I don't like to use yeah. videos because there's one nurse dude. He's like, he's really kind of likable, but he says stuff that's like, oh my God, you're, you, don't, you don't get it. He's kind of like the blind leading the blind and I always worry about who's listening to that because he doesn't know what he's talking about either. The best ones to listen to are physicians. They usually do a good job, but then again, it's, they don't know how far back to go in theory. So it's always like, it's not dumbing it down. It's connecting all the dots from elementary understanding to complex understanding. Yeah. It's so, dumbing down. But it's a ladder. You have to have all the rungs in place. Yeah. And even when you were explaining it right now, the whole, you know, right side and left side, I, I understood it. But this morning with Kassar's explained, I was like, what the hell is he talking about? I know. That's why I'm doing it. This I'm really stepping out of my lane. No other assessment teachers cover the ABGs and this level, but it bugs me to see students completely lost. And then, frankly, it hurts the assessment in the end anyways. So right. So what I get is a, a student's coming out of a, uh, Mr. Casares' class, essentially muttering gibberish about, you know, electrolytes and CO2 levels, but they really don't understand what they're saying. They're just kind of repeating what they heard, like a toddler, you know, saying words they just picked up. Yeah, it doesn't do and that's where, I, that's where I, I always try to understand it to, for the most part. And I am, I'm understanding. I, I can say that I'm actually understanding the concepts. It's just when I'm learning them, it takes me a little while to actually get it. 
and that's perfect. I, I truly believe the longer it takes you to learn it, the better you retain it. Yeah. Everyone I've known in technical fields, with very few exceptions, when they just memorize stuff because they're really good at it, they could shit it out for a test. A year later, they don't remember what the hell. They don't know anything. They're the ones who in the field, they'll say, oh, that was a medical school. I don't remember that stuff anymore. If they don't remember it, that means they didn't learn it. Right. When you, uh, anyways. It, you know it. And I could tell, Matt, I know you're struggling your tests, but you definitely, this is a kind of gut thing, but just talking to you guys, um, I, can see, I can know when someone just doesn't have it. I'm not talking emotionally. I'm not talking attitude because attitude is your effort. But I could tell when someone is just not smart enough, they've got a learning disability, they either, they're not going to get it now. And that isn't uh, an accusation. It's like telling a person they're colorblind. You're not going to recognize yellow and green. It's just it's not your fault. It just is. You're not in that category, but you're going to have to make a serious effort and really kind of uh, jump through hoops. This isn't, again, a comparison, but I told you um, this is like way more school for me doing this class than it was going to medical school. I've spent so many hours on this class and it's really tedious and time consuming and you don't see it. And that's not your job. You're not supposed to see it. I'm only telling you that is that you're not the only one that has to make an effort. What you're learning on your side, I have to learn on this side. It's all the same struggle. If you're yes, not sir. ready for it, like a couple of students that you could tell they're really not into it. That's okay. There are people that I want to be a medic, like we talked about, Robert Hurt. I don't know if you're there. And there's people that are like, oh, it'd be nice to be a medic. It, the it'd be nice crew ain't going to get there unless they just happen to be lucky geniuses. Mm -hmm. Most people have to bust their ass to get through. And that's what also, get what, that patch means something. Yeah. Remember, you, you're the, the, you make the patch. You can put paramedic on this side, doctor on that side, professor here and fucking guru there. You're still the same dipshit. <laughs> just patches. But take you and put you in freaking Aloha slippers and a flip flops and a straw hat and a cotton cob pipe. But you know the shit. No one can take the knowledge and competence out of you, but no one can dress you up in it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll take a break. Uh, I'll probably, if you guys are doing it tomorrow, there's a good chance I'll see you. But I, I need a break right now, so you guys have fun. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, see All you right. thank you for everything, Mr. You're very welcome, very welcome. Nice, uh, keep uh, putting new screen backgrounds on there. <laughs>